They're really competent. Um, and the Doctor? Oh, Dr. Rennie is somewhere. Yes, okay. she's, she's out there. She'll be in, in a minute. Also, Caroline's joining us from the States. Steve Denyer, all the usuals, as you'd expect, head-to-head -head with Jonathan Liss and Benedict Spence. Okay. Thank you. Um, listen, uh, I have to say, by the way, uh, thank you to Dave Chawner. Just going to finish on a text. It was marvellous, Dave. Steve <laughs> in Gloucester, who says, just turned on and off. I don't need a queer fest at seven o'clock on a Saturday morning. Well, David Bull's coming up next, so <laughs> good luck with that. I uh, hope you enjoy <laughs> Talk TV. I'm going to be back child. same time, same place tomorrow morning. It's Talk TV. <laughs>now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show, and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale, and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? Ah, <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you stick to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Cooper. I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Hello, very good morning to you. It's just after 7 o'clock on Saturday, April the 13th. I'm David Bull. This is Weekend Breakfast. Thank you very much indeed for your company, wherever you're joining us from uh, in this country or indeed around the world. Now, as you would expect, I have great news for you this morning. Yes, of course I do. It's International Plant Appreciation Day today. It's a day dedicated to recognising plants' incredible diversity, beauty and importance. Uh? Yes, and I have to say I love my begonias. Also, great news because it's International Scrabble Day today, a day when we celebrate the popular board game. Now, it actually falls on April the 13th to mark the birthday of its creator, Alfred Mosher Butts. Yay! Yes, indeed. And uh, also great news because the Take That Tour 2024 begins today in Shefford. One big question for you. Could it be magic? Yes, I think it could. Wow! <laughs> Let's take that uh, beginning in Sheffield today. Right, let's start today's show, shall we? Today's fascinating facts. So today's fascinating facts on this day in 1570 was the birth of Guy Fawkes. He was born in York. He was also known as Guido Fawkes, and that was the name he adopted whilst fighting for the Spanish in the Low Countries. Now, of course, we know why he was famous. He's famous for being part of the group of English Catholics who planned the failed gunpowder plot in 1605. On this day in 1742, Handel's Messiah made its world premiere. Guess where it was? Well, it was in Dublin, in Ireland. And on this day in 1935, Imperial Airways and Qantas inaugurated their London to Australia air service. And those are today's fascinating facts. Well, talking of someone who's never off a plane, Dr. Randy Hunterkamp joins me this morning. Good morning. Good morning. I've Good. been on a lot of planes in the last you look, two You're weeks. looking very rosy. I, it was quite hot. Slash burnt. A little bit. Are you a little bit burnt? It wasn't Did so Did you put warm. on sunscreen? Forgot on the last day. Doctor. I was only watering the garden. Doctor. It was quite hot. Sunscreen. I know. Sunscreen. I know. You won't keep your beautiful looks if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't put on your sunscreen. Now, that, today... That bird has flown. <laughs> oh, rubbish, rubbish. Now, can I just tell you, it is the Grand National today. I know. Um, and, which is very exciting, actually. And, and it's probably the one sporting event we as a family always sat down to watch. Um, and we used to place... Earlier bit. today. Uh, it's four o'clock, I yes. believe. Yes. Is that earlier? Yes. Oh. Um, anyway, um, so it's taking place at Aintree, and all these women look absolutely fantastic, dressed up to the nines, I think, going to the races. I, I remember as a child, we were sort of betting, I, I kind of want to say 10p or a pound. It or wouldn't something. have been much. No, it wasn't very much, and I was always rubbish at it. Uh, but apparently, uh, they have reduced the numbers. There were 51 horses running. They've reduced them down to 34. Uh, and uh, so it's four miles and two furlongs race. And obviously, they're trying to increase safety of said race. Now, I've been looking at the runners and riders. Have you looked? I have. Oh, have you? Mm -hmm. What's your favourite? Well, I was having a look at... There's one called Coco Beach. Coco Beach. I like that. Sounds like a cocktail. I quite like that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I quite like that. Uh, so, Coco Beach there. Um, I quite liked I Am Maximus. Yes, I saw strong. that. Yeah, strong. strong. Um, and then there's a horse in Rapunzel called Maximus. Uh, there's also... We were talking about El Dorado earlier. <laughs> El Dorado Allen, uh, which, is, which is running. But my favourite is Mr Incredible. Yeah. So yeah. I need to back that, 12 to 1. Yeah, I always pick by the names. It's nothing to do with anything else, it's just the names. I, and Cocoa Beach was the one that stood out to me. I, I found one for you. Uh, it's 40 to 1. Mm -hmm. mm. Foxy Jacks. <laughs> do you fancy that? It's all right. Oh. It's all right. Ain't that a shame? I quite like ain't that a shame, <laughs> but I think shame. he's That's won a few times, one. that one. Yeah, yeah. not doing very well. Um, the Goffer. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that's the Grand National, as you say, slightly earlier. So and of course, you know what happens now that there are less horses? Yes. They run faster to the first fence. Do they? Yeah. So it's actually increased the speed of the race oh. to the first. So I, so I actually, we'll talk to Tom Clayton because I want to put a bet on. And obviously yeah. you have to be over 18 to bet and make sure you and do it responsibly. And bet Yes, all that stuff. But actually I'm quite fancy putting a bet on Mr Incredible, 12 to 1. I actually won some money last year. Did you? I what did. did you win? £1.95? No, I won about £120. Oh, well done. Because I did an each way Spread bet. bet. Oh. Each way. Each way. So it, should always do each way. Should you? So, and because there's so many runners. What does that mean? 
it means that if they come in the top places, yes. which can be top three to top five, depending right. on the race, and in this one it'll probably be top five, right. you get money. You get slightly less than if you'd done... Oh, each to way. Win. And then well, way. I'll talk to him because I want to know how to place a bet. Because in the old days, I'd go to a betting shop. Online. Yes, but I don't know how to do well, that. Well, I, I could tell you. Oh, okay. to Tom. Well, Tom's a sporting <laughs> expert. Uh, right, OK, let, let's talk about a number of things. Should we talk about this big story? I said... What so, could that possibly well, be? Well, exactly. And I have been talking about this, I think, for over a week now. And I keep being told, oh, it's going to go away. We're talking, obviously, about Angela Rayner this morning. I said that this has got mileage and it will not go away. And everyone is reporting this. Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, says she will step down if she is found to have broken the law. She goes on to say she is completely confident I followed the rules at all times. Now she's been accused of giving false information about her main residence in a row about who lived in her former council house. She goes on to say, if I committed a criminal offence, I will, of course, do the right thing and step down. The British public deserves politicians who know the rules apply to them. This, there's so much hypocrisy in this. It's so just much. unbelievable. So she brought it under the right to buy scheme, which, by the way, she doesn't want to continue. Or well, she wants to lower the levels of discount. Right. So she benefited, but no one else can benefit in the same way that she did. If she lived in that house, or she didn't live in that house, she benefited, we think, from a single person discount. She made £48,500 profit. She's saying, well, even if I made a mistake, it's only about £1,000 to £3,000. Not the point. Not the point. I mean, not the point. And actually, the PR behind this, as I said to you earlier, is absolutely shockingly bad for people that are politicians and in the front line because what she should have done when this story raised its head is say look do you know what I made a mistake please let me pay the extra tax it was just an oversight yeah. on my part because that's acceptable in tax away. law that's acceptable you know mm. you can make mistakes you still have to pay for them but you can mm. make mistakes it would have gone away but now they're digging in and digging in she has to dig in because what else can she say now she has to say I, I feel I've done nothing wrong but, yes, the hypocrisy is huge, especially when she has regularly called for people to resign over lesser things, to look at people's tax... Um, yes! Tax so, filings. including at Shatamurti, if you recall, she said, well, you need to disclose your tax details. Meanwhile, oh, I'm... I, I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to disclose mine. Also, do you remember Jill Mortimer in the Hartlepool by-election? She said you need to disclose your tax return, and now she's refusing to disclose I hers. I mean, it really is frank hypocrisy. Lots of people messaging already. Bill, good morning in Cheshire says uh, the issue is being investigated again by Greater Manchester yeah. Police, and this is why the story is in the front pages this morning. By the way, David, the Mayor of Manchester is Andy Burnham. I do wonder whether. Angela Rayner knows something because to issue that kind of rebuttal makes me think that she's had some strong advice. It also applies pressure on the police, David, and I think that's what Starmer did over Beergate mm. by saying I'm going to stand down if I'm found guilty. That was pressure on the police, that if you find me guilty, I'm going to have to resign. Yeah. She's just done the same thing, and I have no confidence that Greater Manchester Police will find her as anything but innocent. Uh, we'll talk about this uh, later, um, and also just in terms of that, uh, just whether it is truly uh, hypocritical. Let me ask you the question this morning, which is in light of yet another political scandal. Scandal. I roll my eyes again. What has uh, this done to your faith in British politics? The number to call 0344 499 1000. You can also WhatsApp as well to the same uh, number. You can also text the word talk in your message to 8722. Also, you can tweet or, sorry, exes at talk TV. Did you bring it? Oh, you brought it. Mm. Uh, then leave a space. Hashtag breakfast doctors. I look very surprised. I believe we got a clip, actually, of uh, Angela Rayner and her response to, to exactly uh, what is going on and her response to the fact that she says she will stand up and say she was right. Well, Steve, Steve has just messaged in to say Rayner's statement is exactly the same wording as the one made by Starmer before he was found to have done nothing wrong in Durham. It stinks just like Beergate did interesting isn't it and if you remember Angela Rayner was um, having a go at Boris as you rightly say we've got a clip of that let's oh, have a look sorry. now there's a police investigation and the terms of reference for Sue Gray set by the Prime Minister himself are clear if any evidence emerges of behavior that is potentially a criminal offense the matter will be referred to the police so it seems, Mr Speaker, potential crim criminality has been found in Downing Street. Yeah. What a truly damning reflection on our nation's very highest office.
What do you make of that? Well, firstly, I'm looking at all those Muppets sitting there with face masks on. But other than that... <laughs> we digress. I mean, we digress. I mean, look, it's, it is exactly as you say. You can't... People in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And, of course, it's on the record. And, of course, people like us can play it back to her mm -hmm. and say true hypocrisy. Interesting, Keir Starmer was asked twice, actually, mm -hmm. um, by, uh, by a journalist here in this building, um, do you have 100% confidence in Angela Rayner? And he refused to answer it, actually. And then, I believe it was Harry Cole, actually, and then um, he, he went on to say, I have full confidence. Well, <laughs> hang on a minute, is, it, is that 100% confidence or full confidence? And what exactly are the ramifications of that? Many of you already uh, wading in on this. Raina is confident because she knows today's police are not competent investigators. Why wasn't this done properly first time? Rene is correct. Thank you, Mick, for that. Um, Dan says, uh, Dan in Kent says, oh, Angela Raina is using the showing of tax returns as a political football to get ministers on the opposite bench to do the same. I do want to move on and talk about some other stories because we will come back to that later on this morning. Graham Stewart um, has stepped down as energy security minister or energy minister. I don't know what to make of this. The Beverly and Holderness MP says he wants to focus on local issues yeah. after um, serving in various ministerial posts. So what's behind that? I found this very odd like you and mm. I don't know what to make of it. What I'm wondering is, is does he realise that the government's energy position, i.e. net zero, is at odds with his constituents? So he wants to distance himself from it before an election so that he ca can campaign. I'm pleased you brought that up because later on in the head-to-head -head we're going to be talking about all these offshore wind farms and of course they've got to cable them, haven't they? So there are pylons, they are planning them from North Norfolk all the way down to Tilbury in Essex and they're going to march across Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, and who voted for that? You are very pylonophobic, aren't you? I am. I hate pylons. <laughs> They're vile. I agree with they, you. They blight the landscape. They're horrible. They're horrible. But then digging up the countryside to plant cables for these windshore off off sure wind farms is going to be the same isn't it we'll talk about that later with okay. benedict Spess and uh, jonathan liss as well so that's that also uh, we'll talk about when the general election is going to be as well um, i wonder what you made of this i found it in the british medical journal and uh, and i'm sure you will have something strong to say uh, you know, well, about first, it first shall i just say what it is yes so muslim doctors in the uk saying they are being unfairly censored when expressing concerns about the humanitarian situation in gaza one in ten which actually is ten percent so actually not the other ninety percent but one in and also they weren't all doctors. Only 33% of them were doctors. That's interesting. Right. And yet the headline says Muslim exactly. doctors. Um, so, oh, yes, you're right, because it says Muslim healthcare professionals yes. who took part. So 650 of them took part in a survey by the British Islamic Medical Association said they'd expressed opinions in the workplace on the Palestinian crisis and as a result had experienced problems such as formal meetings with supervisors, disciplinary investigations and referral to the General Medical Council. Right, so this is what I feel about this. Yes. Firstly, they weren't all doctors, the headline's misleading. Secondly, I can I promise you that my Jewish friends who are doctors wouldn't even raise this issue no, for wouldn't. the same reasons. They would just be quiet. So perhaps the way forward for people in these positions is to not have an opinion, to actually get on with the job at hand, which is I treating agree. patients. I agree. It is not It is not the right place to, to discuss politics. Because their patients are going to be Jewish, their patients are going to be Muslim. Let's not make any of them and feel uncomfortable. in pink, I wrote, work is not a place for politics. <laughs> so we agree. But I thought I'd give you the right of riposte on that, because I saw that and I thought, well, Renny will love that one. <laughs> Um, now, this is interesting. You and I spoke about this long COVID. We're mm. seeing a lot of people diagnosed with long COVID. And this is an article in The Telegraph saying that actually long COVID symptoms may be driven by the reactivation of dormant viruses, yeah. such as herpes. And they, the reason for that is actually it's not down to the COVID vi virus itself, but it's due to inflammation caused uh, as a result of, of having originally yes. COVID, but, but then reactivation of other viruses. Absolutely. And interestingly in this, because most of the studies are now saying that long COVID doesn't really exist yes. as an entity, but it does, post-viral syndrome does exist, which we've always known about. And if it goes on for a long time, it turns into ME, mm. um, chronic fatigue syndrome. However, this is interesting because the people here that were most affected were the ones who ended up in hospital. So the ones that had a massive viral load and has a, had a massive inflammatory response. Mm. Mm, interesting, isn't it? And they go on to say 1.9 million people report symptoms of long COVID, which can include fatigue, brain fog and muscle aches. But they go on to say that actually this is due to inflammation that's been caused, reactivation of viruses like the herpes virus, for example, Epstein-Barr, yeah. which we know causes glandular fe 
believer, for example. One in ten people carry EBV. And I just thought this was really interesting, actually. We're so, we're so quick to jump on things like long COVID. And the minute you diagnose someone with something like long COVID, you get labelling, stigma, deviance, people you then illness behaviour. Yeah, exactly. And also, the other thing about this is most studies that have looked at long COVID have discovered that people were more likely to have symptoms of long COVID when they've never been infected with COVID. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's a very grey area. But we mustn't dismiss the people, obviously, that feel like they're suffering from something because we need to no, try course. and find a way to get them back to normal functioning. Of, of course. Um, I wanted to talk about why being a mother ages you, but we'll do that tomorrow. Mm. I thought you'd like that one as well. But very quickly, I just want to tell you about this bird. You may have seen this, actually. It's, it, <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, this is a bird. Uh, um, basically, police officers very, very concerned and confused about what was going on because uh, they left their police car and then they, and they heard <laughs> their siren going on the police car. So they went back to the police car and they were like, what's going on? Um, anyway, uh, they thought their vehicles had developed to fall so they reported look my police car's making a noise when I'm not actually there but it wasn't actually the police car let's have a look and there you go so this is, this is absolutely brilliant. So this was a bird mimicking the sound yeah. of uh, the sirens and apparently it could have been a starling. Yeah, so I was going to say starlings are very good at mimicking. Isn't that brilliant? But it's really interesting. When we're in Spain at our house, we have dinner in the evening in a courtyard. Sorry, just drop that again. No, no, no. We have dinner <laughs> in the evening in the courtyard. We always have music playing. Yes. And a little bird, some sort of tit or something, <laughs> comes along, sits up on the roof and sings along. <laughs> Every single time. <laughs> what can it sing? <laughs> Anything. Really? Can it do Abba? Probably, yeah. because we do do Dancing Girl. Dancing Queen, sorry. I, 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 have, I have no doubt about that. <laughs> I have no doubt. Um, thank you very much indeed for the moment, Dr Rene. Uh, let me just ask you that question again. In light of yet another political scandal, what has this done? to your faith in British politics. The number 0344 499 1000. WhatsApp us as well to that. You can also text us, text the word talk in your message to 8722. You can also X us at uh, Talk TV. Leave a space. Hashtag Breakfast Doctors. Uh, after the break, it's time for the papers. Mr Julian Drucker will join us for that. Uh, don't go anywhere. This is Talk TV. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read a statement this morning from the family 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast, the time 7.24 now on Saturday, April the 13th. The Doctor's in, Dr Rene is with me, also joining us this morning to run through the papers, Mr Julian Drucker, resplendent. Good in morning. A, in a, a, all in blue. Thank you. Um, <laughs> how, are, how are you both, Doctors? Good, yes, thank, good, thank you. you. How about you? What have you been up to? Um, it's a weird time, isn't it? We don't really know. You know, we're waiting for lots of things, aren't we? Election, obviously there's local elections. Um, mm. It's a little bit uneasy, isn't it? We're just waiting for the... For the big one. I did get a lovely brochure through the post um, about the mayor election. Yes, I got that. Did you? Yes. That had a, a, a double page spread for each candidate. Yes. Wow. So now I haven't had that. It's now on my log burner. My, mine's actually <laughs> um, in the recycle. Right, okay. Yeah. Right, okay, yeah. fine. <laughs> um, so obviously, mayoral elections, local elections as well. Yes. Just let me ask you, when is the general? When's he going to call it? Well, in one of the stories we're going to come to, there's suggestions it's gone back to November again now, November 14th. It's probably going to be January. I think, I think it's January. I think October 17th. Everyone, so lots of political commentators are saying that date, oh, October. They copied me. They copied you, mm -hmm. obviously. Ryan Saby <laughs> said it was going to be October the 17th. It can't be January. That would be a campaign over Christmas. Yeah, would. that's, yeah. That, people are not going to go but, for that. But he will wait because he wants to see the econo economy yes, recover. Yeah. We've seen that actually there are signs that it <laughs> may be vaguely recovering 0.1%. Uh, mm. Also, the boats, of course, the safety of Rwanda bill goes through. We think it yes. will go through on Wednesday of this coming week. Oh, okay. um, so he will be be able to say oh look I've got a plane going away although Rwanda Air won't actually send anyone now yes um, so so it's so I agree it's interesting political times Gosh. just before we start uh, with some tremendous stories that mm. you've chosen uh, Julian uh, let's just go through this morning's front pages if you are just waking up let's start with the times if we can um, this is what Rene and I were talking about earlier on this morning. Pressure on Starmer as police look into deputy. So Keir Starmer under renewed pressure last night. Police opening an investigation into claims. And these are very serious claims. that he, She actually, Angela Rayner, broke electoral law. Just to remind you, she bought this house under the right to buy scheme. Uh, she said it was her main residence. She then sold it, made 48,500 profit. But also there are, there are questions whether she broke electoral law here. And of of course, we now know Greater Manchester Police has reopened uh, its investigation into Angela Rayner. She's been accused of giving false information for the electoral register when she lived between two former council houses in Stockport in the 2010. Same, uh, exactly the same story in the Daily Telegraph. Rayner says, I will quit if guilty over the house row. They go on to say in a defiant statement, she said she was completely confident that she'd followed the rules at all times after police launched an investigation into claims she had broken electoral law. She turns it back onto the Conservatives. She accuses the Conservatives of reporting her to the police as a political tactic. The Daily Mail covers exactly the same story as well. Rayner, I'll quit if I am found guilty. She promised to resign if a police probe into her past living arrangements finds she broke the law. Moving on to the Daily Mirror, Completely different uh, take on this. Bring it on is the headline. Uh, they say Angela Rayner has vowed to clear her name in a police probe on her home's setup. The, the defiant MP said she'd quit if she had broken the law. Just moving on to the economy now in the Daily Express. Hunt, we've done the hard yards. Now I will cut, cut taxes and bet on growth. This is a rallying cry to the nation, according to the Daily Express. 
Uh, nothing to do with an imminent general election, of course, that they might possibly cut taxes. Um, the front page of the FT this morning, Bernanke warns the Bank of England must change. We're going to talk about this, actually, later on this morning because it's a really important story about the um, basically the Bank of England using outdated techniques and methodology, which then informs their interest rates um, decisions. And we'll talk about this because the Bank of England's forecasting model needs overhauling after significant shortcomings contributed to its recent failure to foresee surging inflation. This is according to the former Federal Reserve Chair, Ben Bernanke. The I, a different story completely on the front page, UK intelligence officials targeted in honey trap sex plots by Chinese spies. This comes on the back, of course, of the Will Rag saga. Apparently, British intelligence officers are being repeatedly targeted in blackmail attempts. Chinese agents try to start sexual relationships in a bid to compromise security, and there are fears that UK politicians and business people remain vulnerable to extortion. The Guardian leads on the carers story, which we did during the week. The scandalous prosecution of unpaid carers uncovered by The Guardian must end now and an inquiry must be launched immediately. According to them, Rishi Sunak has been told. Three former work and pension secretaries and the Labour Party demanded to know why thousands of people who care for their loved ones had been hounded for thousands of pounds and in some cases convicted after unwittingly breaching earnings rules by just a few pounds a week. Uh, the Sun, uh, one big headline nightmare. Apparently a gang of squatters has set up home in telly chef Gordon Ramsay's swanky £13 million pub. Uh, they've used his own cooking appliances as well to barricade themselves into the Grade 2 listed building near Regent's Park in central London. And uh, Chris Packham is front page of the Daily Star. TV God says hug a hornet. The world's greatest naturalist, Chris Packham, says we need to learn to love Asian hornets, mm. even though they are beastly to our British bees. He can hug my hornet. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> That's a bit much. It's 7.30. Time for the headlines. <laughs> Thanks for that. That's very kind. Um, Gillian. Yes. Over to you. Angela Rayner. Let's show, uh, yeah, GMP, Greater Manchester Police, uh, issued their statement yesterday morning, and then she moved the story on, didn't she, sort of yesterday evening, saying um, she'll quit, similar to Keir Starmer. You were saying, Rayner, about beer gate, uh, puts pressure on police. Um, look, it's out of their hands now, isn't it? It's all about timing, isn't it? We're saying about the local elections, and, you know, Labour now has to wait for Greater Manchester Police to do this investigation. Could be a month could be a couple of months, but it's, you know, they have these grids, don't they? And now, mm. they could, although they will keep saying, you know, there's an investigation going on, so in a way, you know, they can't talk about it if they're on the campaign trail. But, you know, they're, they're now not in control of timing. So, so, so what does this do to the Labour Party? Because they were riding high, they were doing very well. If you look at the latest polls, doing very well. Although in the latest um, sort of uh, multi-analysis, Labour has fallen a few points. Mm. Does this... Does this yet another scandal change the way people feel about political parties in general and the Labour Party? Probably in general. I don't think it would change much with the polls, would it? Um, you know, really? polls aren't shifting. But do you think? But do you think those polls are actually really reflecting the mood? Because I, I am absolutely a hundred percent sure that people lie in polls now and we've seen it time yeah. and time again mm -hmm. Brexit Trump and I think when they get to the ballot box because there's so much pressure on people not to be right wing that they get to the ballot box, the curtain closes behind them, they can say whatever they want. Mm. And we talked about this. When, pe when someone approaches you and say, uh, you know, how are you going to vote? I would lie. <laughs> <laughs> and I think lots of people would. I mean, I wrote an article about this. And the reason that we got Trump and everyone was so surprised was because people were too embarrassed to say it. You know, Hillary Clinton called them, what did you call them, deplorables. Yes, yes. People that's good, vote. deplorables. Exactly. So when you're, when you're criticised and called names, you just say, OK, well, I'm just not going to say it, <laughs> but I'm going to do it. Yeah. yeah. But even in the margin of error, it's clear. I mean, there's going to be a landslide for Labour, isn't there? Um, but you just sort of think there won't there won't be this sort of see, Blair see, honeymoon. See, I, I don't buy that. I just don't buy it. I think those. Uh, I think the polls are soft. Also, they know they actually don't have the lead they think they have. And I think That's... it's more than a margin of error. I'm not talking about yeah, margins yeah, yeah, of okay, error. Yeah, now, yeah. now, they're doing very well in Scotland. They've beaten the SNP for yeah. the first time in those polls, it's, and they need Scotland. They need Scotland. It's such a shame that the SNP imploded when it did, actually, because yeah. it does hand Labour a much easier ride. It, it really does. But also, all of those people who are saying they're voting Labour because they're so fed up with the Tories, when push comes to shove, do they actually say, I'm going to vote for the charismatic 
like Keir Starmer, I'm not so sure. Or do they just not come out? Or do they not come out? Which I mean, is we, equally damaging. But low attendance actually favours the Tories on mm. the whole because the Conservative voters tend to come out. Yes, yes. Um, look, I mean, you, you just get the feeling... Um, even if Labour win, as they're expected to, there won't, there won't be the sort of 1997 honeymoon. People are more cynical about politicians mm. now. And you feel as if, even with Labour in, there will be these types of stories about police investigations, that sort of thing. You know, p people's views of politicians have changed so much in 25 mm. years, haven't they? That, you know, actually it won't be that much different with a different party. I mean, also, what do you make of this, Angela Rayner? I can't get over the frank hypocrisy. We were talking about it with that Shatter Murty saying we need to understand your tax details. Jill Mortimer, who ran in Hartlepool, mm. she was attacked by Angela Rayner saying you need to disclose your tax details. And yet when Angela Rayner is asked to disclose her tax details, no, I'm not going to do that. But Angela Rayner is very good at being hypocritical, not just about things like this. So she can call people Tory scum, but if anybody said that about her or Labour, there would be uproar about it being racist you know because she's a northern lass because she's working class so, so that's what labor is now saying so labor is pushing back saying you're attacking her because she's working class she came from a council house it's nothing to do with that she may well have broken the law mm. and also she's disappeared as it's, it's fair to say she's not done interviews for weeks and weeks um this came through yesterday we obviously won't see her now for weeks and weeks um and Keir Starmer's a bit weird in some of the sort of interviews. Won't she be back though when recess is over? We well, should be back, but I'm saying she won't be as visible. Well, she sits on the front. And range. actually, what, yeah. if, if the toys well, were being speaking. clever, if the toys were being clever, what they would do then is Rishi would find a really important meeting that he has to go to, so he can't do Prime Minister's yes. question times. So then uh, Keir won't do it, and Ooh, Angela like will that. have to step it in. Be all oh, oh, I'm versus, good. Uh, You're yeah. Machiavellian, you are. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, no, that's a really good idea. Maybe he could be sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, throw a sickie. Covid. <laughs> There's always COVID, the chance of that. There'll be lots of stuff like D-Day commemorations or whatever yeah. coming up in the next few months. So, so, so what did you, as a journalist, make about Keir Starmer being pushed by Harry Cole, saying, do you have 100% confidence in Angela Rayner? He refused to answer it twice. Yes. He then paraphrased and said, I have full confidence. Now, they sound very similar. They're not the same. Yes, he probably knew this was coming from GMP. He said similar things yesterday, didn't he? And it's unusual, well, not unusual, but um, it was surprising that Angela Rayner didn't issue her statement. It was about seven or eight hours, wasn't it, before we got this uh, statement about mm. that she would quit. Uh, but as you said, you know, this is what Keir Starmer said previously over Beergate. Puts that extra pressure on police, doesn't it, to make sure... You know, they're 100% correct. But, but it just reminds me of Beergate with, with Starmer and Rayner having a jolly in that, you know, in that building. No, found no, no. Not, it was oh, work, Jamie. Oh, it was work, sorry. It was sorry, necessary yes, for work. Because I always need beer for work, oh, you I know. Do. I have to say, I really do. <laughs> <laughs> Working here. Um, I mean, it will be interesting to see how this unfolds. There's another big story as well about Labour. Yes. They're having briefing meetings saying, just don't be complacent in terms of the election result. And also, just going back to previous years, uh, you know, Know, as we spoke about 2016 when Trump won, for example, which was a complete shock to everyone, strange things happen in politics. Mm. But when you've got John Curtis, I think he was on here as well last week, wasn't he, or a couple of weeks ago, saying that they are 99% he did say percent, that. Uh, likely to form the next, elect form the next not, government. Not with a landslide. He didn't say how. No, he just he said to form yeah. it. And also, just because of coalition talks of it came to that, nobody would do a deal with the I mean, the one thing I will tell you is it's getting very nasty out there. Yes. There's a yeah. lot of stuff being yes. thrown around uh, to, to all parties, actually, which is, I think it's a real travesty, actually, because uh, politics should be above that. And if we descend to that kind of, you know, gutter... But isn't that just reflective of this world that we're in so. now, where everything is nasty, everybody's looking for a gotcha, everybody's trying to catch you out? Mm, mm, I I totally agree. Shall we move on yes. and talk about Liz Truss, who, yes. by the way, I did meet uh, on Wednesday oh, last really? week, by, by quite by accident, when I bowled over um, <laughs> to say hello. So so she says she, she hated living in a particular house. Yes, I hope you didn't stand too close, because <laughs> there's the possibility uh, that she's got fleas. Or oh. rather, she said she's that there were fleas around in her very brief tenure at Downing Street, 49 days. Lots of people say 44, but they're incorrect. It was, four, it was the 44th day when she... I think it was 49. Well, she resigned on the 44th day and then she left yeah. on the 44th day. Oh. It's pub quiz question, isn't it? Um, see, see, when you have an animal and you don't keep it fleed, 
it please will jump off it so and then you remove the animal from the house and they're like oh no where's dinner gone and the next person that moves in and whether it's an Strauss. animal or a human so the animal was dylan not boris johnson yes well, oh right yes, i'm okay. glad you cleared that up um so so, so so basically she says boris johnson had dylan yes. dylan was infested with fleas yes fleas were all over number 10 and yes. she then was, had fleas. Yes, but she says there's no conclusive evidence, she says. Obviously, the lawyers of this book she's written have made her put that in. <laughs> uh, this is one of the uh, revelations in this new book that's coming out. I mean, so much uh, stuff to unpack. But she talks about the uh, meeting with the Queen. Obviously, she met the Queen on the Tuesday when she became Prime Minister, and then the Queen passed away on the Thursday. And if you thought she probably wasn't going to speak about this moment, because you're sort of not supposed to speak about your sort of dealings with the monarch, are you? No. Um, uh, she does speak about it in this book. <laughs> Um, and just says, you know, they chatted for 20 minutes. As she said, it was clear she, the Queen, was completely attuned to everything that was happening, as well as being typically sharp and witty. There was, simply wasn't any sense that the end would come as quickly as it did. And the Queen gave her some advice, didn't she? She yes. said, take it easy. Yes. And Trust says, in retrospect, she was right. Yes. Yeah, it's almost like she knew about the mini budget. Wasn't she it? did. The Queen. Um, and then on the Thursday, she gets the news. Actually, it was Angela Rayner, ironically, wasn't it? In the Commons, who passed a note to Keir Starmer, mm. didn't she? That was mm. the first many of us knew that something was going on. Um, uh, Liz Truss said, to be told this, that the Queen had died, on only my second full day as Prime Minister, I felt, ut felt utterly unreal. In a state of shock, I found myself thinking, why me? Why now? It's very selfless, isn't it? Um, well, I think I, it's a natural no, I know, response. I, I think I that's a natural response as well. You know, you, you've it's reached surreal, the pinnacle of it? your career. Yes. And day two, uh, the monarch dies. Yes. I mean... It, it, it's a pretty bad run of luck. Um, but obviously, you know, at the end of the day, there's a human story. And actually, the late Queen looked absolutely dreadful, I thought, when she met yes. Truss. I mean, yes. she, she obviously had geared herself up to it, but I didn't think she looked great. Yeah. I mean... Uh... I think for a 98-year-old woman, I, did, I think she did look great, oh, actually. Okay. Because most of the 98-year-olds I know are actually <laughs> not able to stand and take a meeting and be fully compass mentors. All of your peer group. Yeah. Um, let's pause there just for a moment. Uh, uh, Julian, thank you mm. very much indeed. Time for a break. After the break, we'll come back with the rest of this morning's papers and the, uh, the articles that Julian has chosen. Don't go anywhere. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an Eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast Time, 7.44, Saturday, April the 13th. You're on fire this morning. Thank you very much indeed for all your messages. Good morning, David and Rene, says Gaza in Yorkshire, one of our regulars. Good morning, Gaza. Uh, do you think the Bank of England are using Fujitsu software? I've heard uh, that it gives false readings and misleading data. Thank you very much indeed for that. Now, good morning, says Joanna. Uh, now, about Angela Rayner, what she's done with the sale of her house is small fry compared with Sunak's wife who didn't pay her taxes. Well, she's a non-dom, yeah. isn't she? As for the bird, it cannot be a starling, as a starling is too small. Someone said it could be a blackbird, but I don't think it is a blackbird. I think it's a crow. Yeah, it could be a starling, but starlings tend to flock, actually. Um, but it could be a crow as well. You know, all of those You're birds will mimic. You're now an ornithologist. All of those birds mimic. They How do. How do you know that? Because I'm interested in wildlife and things oh, like that. OK. That's oh. me told. Um... This one from Derek uh, in Newell uh, in Derbyshire. Good morning, doctors. Great show. I always watch you getting to the truth in stories. Thank you very much indeed. I have absolutely no faith or trust in any politicians, let alone any party. In fact, if Mickey Mouse were to stand for Prime Minister, I'd definitely vote for him. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, we'll go back to the papers in a minute uh, with Julian Drucker, but it's now time for Tom Clayton's Sporting Weekend. Tom Clayton's Sporting Weekend. Highlight of your week. Highlights of my week. Every yes. week. You're a busy man. Yes, highlight of Thank ours. you. I yes. mean, yeah, it, it, it is a busy week, yes. Very you bounce week. around a number of radio stations and television um, channels. And... It, with it, within our uh, network of mm. uh, radio stations, I'm across all four this morning. Are you? Yes. In demand. In demand. In demand. Well, yes. uh, uh, let's crack on then, because, um, yes, Tom, it's the Grand National. It is the Grand we National. We were talking about that. Um, we were. I only fancy a bit of Mr. Incredible at 12 to 1. I'm sure you do fancy a bit of Mr. Incredible at 12 to 1. I'm sort of more inclined... The thing is with Grand National, they, they have two favourites at the moment, which I'm just getting up on my screen here. Mm. Um, in, uh, uh, what is it, Korak Rambler, who's the defending champion. And 13 to 2. I am Maximus. Both 7 to 30, 1. Well, both of them at the moment, on the live odds that I've got, oh. it me a 13 to 2. Oh. The general rule of thumb is never back the defending champion, even if they're favourites. Although he might do it. Although he might actually do it. Mm. Um, Iron Maximus looking good. Um, as I say, Mr Incredible's not a bad shout. I certainly do wouldn't discourage, discourage it. Um, but no, I think there's a couple of good shouts for the race. I think there's a couple of good opportunities and options. Of course, if you are going to gamble, do be gambler. Now, be now, so, so can plus you just... And, so René is an expert in gambling, apparently. Um, I thought you had to go to a betting shop, but obviously apparently you don't. No, I, I have this wonderful thing called the phone. Oh, yes. On which there are apps. I, I'm familiar with them. On, on which oh. there are apps and I can put things on, on I that. literally have no idea how to do that. Um, oh, well, you download an app and uh, you click on a button yes. and it places it back. Well, you can you. do it online. You can I mean, do it online, just, yeah. Yeah. All right, stop looking at me like that. I obviously am far too busy to go around gambling all the time on like yourself. I actually really... have a tip for you, actually, oh, from one okay, of our people yes. who says that all you need to do is put a combination tricast on the Grand National, three horse selection, six bets. Hang on, wait, well, a combination tricast? Tricast. Horse can come in first, second or third. You can win lots of money for a small stake. I'm writing it down. Okay, that's from Jane <laughs> Ferguson. Oh, thank you, Jane. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, so um, so that's four o'clock today. That's four o'clock today, live on TalkSport. It's to be part of our game day live oh, programme. Awesome. So uh, we'll we'll actually stop the broadcast of the football for a second oh. and go to Aintree for the Grand National. Fantastic. So uh, so they've whittled it down from 51 horses down to 34 yeah. to improve safety. That's right, yeah, because unfortunately we've had a few situations in recent years where the horses don't make it to the end of the race it's it's only a, it's only ever ever a small number it's not like half the field or anything like that but you know still one is too many really realistically mm. so they're trying to make it so that doesn't happen it's always a risk as part of jump racing unfortunately but you know it's got it's you know mm. i think it's good that they're taking a proactive step so do, so do i should we move on to tiger woods yes we shall to move on to tiger woods uh, because he 
has set a new record for making 24 consecutive cuts at the Masters. Now, for those of the, those of you who don't know what a cut is in golf, <laughs> basically a golf tournament is over four days, and after two days, they cut the field down in half pretty much. So everyone who's a million miles off the lead and definitely not going to win misses the cut. That's where the term misses the cut comes from, right. from golf. Oh, right. I um, didn't know that. And uh, basically, Tiger Woods, who's 48 years old, has reached that 24 consecutive times, despite the fact that his body is entirely falling apart. Mm. Glued it's... together with metal plates. Mm. Yes, glued together with metal plates. And, you know, he's just had the most remarkable run. And he's, I say, only seven shots off the lead. But it's Tiger Woods, he's only seven shots off the lead. And when they asked him afterwards uh, on some of the interviews, they said, uh, how, how does it feel to be the record holder? Uh, and what does it mean to you mm. to, make, to make the cut? And he says, well, it means I can be here to compete for the weekend and try and win. Right. Which is just remarkable. Mm. Uh, what a fantastic mindset <laughs> mentality that is. Well, you have to be, I guess. And he always Absolutely. wears red on the final day. I know. That's, it's one of the iconic oh, shots. One of his, his it's one of the iconic charms. shots in golf of him wearing a red a red shirt with black trousers. It's Victory Sunday. That's that's what you call it. It's Victory Sunday. It's and it fantastic. should do with his dad. Oh, that's yeah. nice. That's yeah, nice. so wonderful, yeah. Uh, but yeah, just to get a quick rundown, uh, Scotty Scheffler, Max Homer and Bryson DeChambeau are the three leaders. They're on okay. six under par. Uh, top British interest is, well, it's a tie between Danny Willett and Tommy Fleetwood on one under par, so they're about five shots off lead. Fantastic. Let's move on to this next story, which is about agent fees in the Premier League. Yes, now we all talk about how wonderful it is how much money gets spent on football. Um, speaking sarcastically, of course, there. <laughs> um, but yes, they've uh, announced this week how much clubs have spent on agents' fees, which is basically when a player transfer goes through or when a contract is agreed, it's how much the agent makes from that. It's how much the club pays the agent for, like an administration fee, yeah. effectively. And what um, do they take, 20%, do they, or something? Various agents take right. different different cuts, but usually it's around a certain mark. I'm not 100% sure what it is on the percentage, but the figures have been released this week. Mm. And uh, across the Premier League, across the 20 clubs, they're spending... Four hundred million pounds a year. This year was the highest wow. they've ever done that. First time they've ever gone above uh, four hundred million. And uh, what's the point? Chelsea has spent seventy-five million pounds on agents' fees. We're in the wrong business. We are in the wrong business. <laughs> I, I, I should be a football agent. I think you should. Um, You'd be very good. I'd be a fantastic football yeah. agent. Why don't you do it? I know. I basically <laughs> just wear drab drab shirts. So that's I'm I'm halfway there already. You are halfway there, and you'd yeah. be very wealthy. Absolutely. Yeah. So Excellent. basically just a different aspect of what I am now. <laughs> but again, they charge yeah. what people will pay them. Well, exactly. Market and, rate, I guess, yes, and absolutely. And bear in mind, if they're taking a percentage, then... Yeah, bear in mind if, a, if I don't know if they do, but I mean certainly in television, but, your agent takes yeah. a percentage of. But say, of, of but say the for gig example, you, you know, a play gets sold for a hundred million pounds. They'll take a very small, even if they take a one percent of that, mm. they'll make a million pounds, and then they might agree a contract which is worth two hundred thousand pounds a week. You know, that's many millions over the course of a season Amazing. for which I mean, the I, agent takes quite a. I never saw chance. a poor sporting agent when I lived in LA. Let me just tell no. you that. They, right, make, well, they do very well out of it. Right, well, I will go and retrain as a sporting agent. I think you should. And I live in LA. Live and in live LA. in LA. Well, no. No? No. no. Okay. Uh, Sunny. Uh, this doesn't like the sun. Oh, you LA. don't like the sun. I don't like the sun. I'll go and live in Helsinki instead. <laughs> OK, if you must. Tom, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That was today's Tom Clayton Sporting Weekend. Tom Clayton Sporting Weekend. <laughs> Helsinki? That's the weirdest place. Anyway, uh, Julian, let's just move yes. on uh, and talk about the Prime Minister. So, um, the economy, we've got the figures, yes. we're growing, we're growing, 0.1%. Yes. Well, Tom, um, would, Tom would remember there was a Grand National in a rough quest, 1996. This is what the Tories... <laughs> are now facing in the next few weeks. Well, that's but very good. The Times is saying, you know, there's so much optimism now, as you're saying, yeah. So uh, much. Wednesday next week, official inflation figures, it's expected to show it's fallen to 3.1%, from 3.4%. From 3.4%. Although, isn't inflation to do with the Bank of England rather than the Prime Minister anyway? So why is he taking credit? You might... Ask. Well, because well, the Bank of England yes. seems to be rubbish at forecasts. Well, they, well, yeah, <laughs> they, they are. <laughs> but, but obviously inflation will be a mark Yeah, no, obviously, the yes, yes, yeah. And Thursday, as you said... Because he does say one of his things was grow the economy, wasn't it? Yeah, so, yeah. So he, so he needs it to be, yeah. Uh, Thursday, then, as you said, uh, they're hoping the safety of Rwanda bill is going to be passed through the mm. Lords and the Commons. So it's in ping-pong at the moment, so it yes. goes between the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Yes. 
Um, but, you know, these letters going into the 1922 committee... Uh, How many? We'll, well, we'll never find out, because Graham Brady, uh, mm. unlike Liz Truss, never reveals anything. Um, it's 53, is it? I always thought it was... 53. Fi- thought it was 50, but 53 is the threshold. Um, supposedly, the Times says, I'm sure it's very well-sourced, they say that number 10 is confident that they're nowhere near 53. But this is before the local elections, obviously, isn't it? Uh, just to bring you some breaking news, reports of a major incident at a shopping centre in Bondi in Australia. Australia. We'll uh, bring you more on that uh, as it comes in. That's reports of a major incident at a shopping centre in Bondi in Australia. As I say, we'll bring you more information on that uh, as and when we get it. Um, where were we just? We were just talking about um, just about the 53 MPs. They need 15%, yeah. which is 53 MPs. Their working majority, by the way, do you remember, was 80. Mm. It then went down to 56. Guess what it is now? No idea. 52. And falling. Yes, but that is still big, isn't it? It, I is mean, it just shows you what they've well, squandered. You would never since. know, would you? <laughs> yeah, they've you squandered that. <laughs> Absolutely right. I you mean, they, never... they might as well be leading in opposition. Yeah. yeah. And let's move on and talk about uh, your next. Uh, this is yes. the Sun, page 14. Bank of England blasted for its dodgy forecasts, says the Sun. Um, <clears throat> says Ben Bernanke, people remember that name, former US Federal Reserve Chairman. He's reviewed the Bank of England because they've been getting these predictions wrong. Uh, obviously, Bank of England said the UK would face a two year long recession. Mm. We know yesterday GDP figures showed a bit of growth. Um, so they're looking at what the Bank of England can do to make its forecast a bit better. Um, he's made 12 recommendations. Um, but Andrew it, Bailey, the governor, has refused to apologise. Yes, he, he has. It's yeah. extraordinary. Do you think that one of the recommendations is should be that people running the Bank of England should actually be qualified in economics and financial stuff? Because Andrew Bailey wasn't. He he has his base qualifications and nothing to do right? with the job that he's got. And this is the problem that we have. Jobs for the boys. It doesn't matter mm. what your qualification mm. is. Here you come, seven hundred and fifty thousand well, pounds a year. Yeah, let's put that to Edmund Greaves. He's going to be joining us in about fifteen minutes. So he's editor at uh, Mouthy Money and host of the Mouthy Money podcast. Uh, we'll ask him. Let's ask him that. Mm. He's not as visible as he, Andrew Bailey, Mark Carney. You know, whatever you think of him. Was I mean, he, around, he then got he? very involved in politics, if you remember, yes, as well he really about did. Brexit. It's like he was leading the country, wasn't it, on mm. Brexit morning, wasn't he, he was. giving that statement? Um, and then finally, if we can yes. go to the mail page. Age 27. Yes. So, can I just throw in? Yes. yes. Andrew Bailey's qualifications are a bachelor's degree in history and a PhD from the Faculty of History in Cambridge. That's useful. So, there you go. So having Dan Snow running yeah. the economy. Tom Clayton it? could do it, couldn't he? <laughs> He could, he could go off and run the Bank of England. Um, yeah, and finally, let's yes. go. This is about sick notes. Sick note, uh, the mail says Britain's sick note epidemic has doubled in just nine years. It's actually England, these figures. But mm. this is from the Policy Exchange think tank. Health workers issued 11 million sick notes in England last year. That's up 108%. Uh, from 5.3 million in 2015. Oh, They're called fit notes as well, aren't they? I um, do feel that when people are being pushed more and more into jobs that pay almost nothing and don't allow you to actually even have a semblance of decent, enjoyable life, you're more likely to go sick or want to go on long-term sick. We need to lift our base wage for everybody so that they can actually enjoy life. There's no point working to have a miserable but the, life. But the minimum wage has gone up, yes, It again. has, I agree. But still, David, think about trying to live on £11 well, but, but, but how, but, no, no, I agree totally. But also, how much of this is also that we... we we made a rod for our own bag, particularly when we furloughed everyone, we allowed people to work at and home. And they found out how fun it was to be at home. And, and it not is work. fun not to work and stay it at is. home, and I quite like to do that myself, yeah, but um, it, it's not possible. And I think this is to, so complicated. And I've I've also stuck up for GPs as well because they're not the right people to be inundated well, with G- all of this. Well, GPs should not have to write long term sick notes. If you need a week off or two mm. weeks off because you've got flu or you've broken your arm, mm. fine. But after that, it should go to someone else I because it, it breaks the relationship. I, I 186 agree. million working days lost due to sickness or injury. Unbelievable. Mm. Unbelievable. Uh, Julian, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Always thank such you. a pleasure to see you. Julian Drucker there uh, with our papers. Right, time for a quick call. Uh, I think talking about Angela Rayner, David uh, joins us from Swindon. Good morning to you. Hello there. Hi. Good morning. Um, basically, when I phoned up, um, you say, I'm, I'm, I need to get it straight. Why are you talking about it so much? You keep, you keep saying, oh, the story's going to go away, but the Tory press and yourself uh, keep dragging it up. Okay, it, let me just finish, because yes. let me just finish, because there's two things. One is capital gains tax, mm-hmm. and, if, and if she's proven to have done wrong and broken the law, then she should stand down. Mm. Also, on her uh, electoral, and the electoral register, mm-hmm. where she voted from, again, if she's done wrong, she should step down. 
But I didn't see Ricky Sunak um, and um, Boris Johnson stepping down when they broke the law. But hang on a minute, hang on, hang, are you conflating this? So, so Angela, oh, the reason we're talking about it is it's on the front pages yeah. of pretty much the majority of papers this morning. And well, it's the a, majority of the papers are run by your boss. That, that, that is not true. That is absolutely not also, true. Also, let's oh, okay. just compare Rishi Sunak and um, Boris yeah. breaking yeah. the law. The law was emergency COVID laws. We're not talking about long-standing, embedded in law, what tax does it laws. Matter? Yes, it, it does, does matter. matter. Because many of those it laws, it does. You, you, say, you say, oh, she's, it's only a thousand Pound, but it's the principle of the thing. Okay, One but you say it's the principle. Okay, then, then it doesn't matter. Right, let me just come back on that. Keir Starmer broke those laws too, but the police said he didn't break them. Those laws well, were so flexible. Break, Somebody's not guilty. They're not guilty. So, so why, so, but, it, but, so you're, so, so why Angela Rayner? Why is she being so defensive? She could have gone, got this to go away, as Renee said quite rightly. If she'd said, look, here, are the, here's the advice that I was given, and so therefore I did nothing wrong. She's made this worse. Well, a lot of politicians, uh, you know, I think you're looking at something about one or two on the Richter scale here, compared with Boris Johnson and some of the scandals we've had, a, a nine or ten. What, other MPs haven't said, oh, yeah, I'm guilty or whatever. I, I, I don't think, to be honest, I don't think that's the point. The point is, actually, I think it's about restoring faith in politics, and I think people are sick and tired of seeing yet and another... She, and she has called for plenty of people to be She, she, and she has, them. and I think it's the frank hypocrisy, actually, that is at the core of this. Um, anyway, uh, let's move on. After the break, uh, we are going to be talking more about uh, the economy. Don't go anywhere. This is Talk TV. We're broadcasting live from central London. <laughs> This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4 pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, oh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for yeah. minute, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong.
Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Cross Talk. One o'clock every weekday. Good morning to you. It's just after 8 o'clock now on Saturday, April the 13th. I'm David Bull. Uh, this is Weekend Breakfast here at Talk TV. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. If you just have uh, woken up, lucky you. Uh, but I have great news for you this morning because it is International Plant Appreciation Day. It's a day dedicated to recognising plants' incredible diversity, beauty and importance. Uh? Yeah. It's also International Scrabble Day, a day when we celebrate the popular board game. It actually falls on April the 13th for a reason. It actually marks the birthday of its creator, Alfred Mosher Butts. Yay! Who knew? Who knew? Also, great news because the Take That Tour 2024 begins and Rene will be there. Uh, she absolutely loves Take That. Uh, it begins in Sheffield today and the question I have for you is could it be magic? Wow. wow! Wow, yeah. Let's start today's show, shall we? Today's fascinating facts. So today's fascinating facts on this day in 1570 was the birth of Guy Fawkes in York. He was also known as Guido Fawkes. And that was the name he adopted whilst fighting for the Spanish in the Low Countries. Now, we know he was famous for being part of the group of English Catholics who planned the failed gunpowder plot in 1605. On this day in 1742, Handel's Messiah made its world premiere in Dublin, in Ireland. And on this day in 1935, Imperial Airways and Qantas actually inaugurated their London to Australia air service. And those are today's fascinating facts. Dr. Rennie is with me this morning. I have some more for you as well. Excellent. On this I love it when you have more. <laughs> well, everyone does. <laughs> uh, on, on this day in 1912, the Royal Flying Corps was uh, uh, was formed, later incorporated into the RAF. On this day, and you'll remember this, in 1992 on this day, Neil Kinnock resigned as Labour Party leader and he blamed the Conservative backing press, as we just heard from our last caller, uh, for the party's defeat in the general election. Not um, himself. No, he didn't blame himself, but I just remember him falling in the sea. Do you remember that? Oh, no. Yeah, so he was walking backwards and then there was that wonderful clip which was used in Have I Got News For You where he basically walked backwards and then fell in the sea. Um, and then on this day in 2014, they did research looking at what is it to be British, OK? And research defined Britishness as the monarchy, uh, pubs, Shakespeare, the House of Commons and, of course, the weather. Yeah, the weather. <laughs> the weather. Uh, <laughs> although it's quite nice. It's warmish. Well, it's April, I think. Yeah, I didn't have my heating on when I got back, so it must be better. Oh, I was frozen the other night. <laughs> Utterly frozen. In your flat? You were no, frozen? No, no, I was, oh, in, the I, house. I was okay. in the house. And uh, I was frozen. I had thermal pyjamas on. I had two duvets as well. It was utterly freezing. You need another human being. <laughs> well, <laughs> I need life, actually, Renee, is what I need. Uh, lots of messages coming in. Maureen, good morning to you. Maureen says, when I see Parliament in action, I often think of the monster raving loonies. So I will vote for that party. We're in Perda, so other parties are available, obviously. There are. I've got Jackie, who says, we have a cesspit of a Parliament that has had more skeletons in the cupboard than the National Museum. I don't know of any any business or organisation that has had as much impropriety and survived, we deserved better. In the words of I Trump, agree. drain the swamp. I totally agree. Now, this is quite interesting. Anne in London, we're talking about Angela Rayner and Starmer, and he said, he didn't say, so he was asked, do you have 100% confidence in Angela <laughs> Rayner? And he refused to answer. Then he said, I'm fully confident. He said, let's not play games. He said, let's not play games. Uh, Starmer's carefully chosen words, this is uh, Anne in London, reminded me of the phrase, what don't I know? and when didn't I know it, uttered by Nixon. Uh, thank you for that. This one from Nicholas says, uh, the Grand National is not as grand as it used to be because lower jumps encourage speed and later yes. running time changes the sun and the light for the horse's vision. Yeah. And fewer horses encourage speed horses. because they're not jostling against each other. I'm not sure they have made it that much safer. Mm, interesting. Um, doctors, my advice for a bet on the Grand National is landfill. 
I know it's a rubbish tip, Angus, that's terrible. Thank you very much indeed <laughs> for that. Um, good morning, brilliant doctors. I think that is a minor bird. There are lots of escaped miners in the UK. Well, they would have to be escaped because they really don't live in Europe anymore. You can buy them, they're very expensive. They're about £225 for each bird. Really? And they do, but lots of birds mimic. It's not just minor it's birds. It's brilliant. No, if you missed that, it was a, a bird mimicking a police siren. Do you remember the ones that we had recently, the parrots that were swearing in the yeah. zoo? <laughs> <laughs> No, I love that. <laughs> and the children love it. <laughs> like, come on, swear again. Swear again. Uh, lots more coming in as well. Keep all of those coming in. Also, just talking... I mean, we were asked earlier, actually, why are you talking about Angela Rayner again? Well, the reason we're talking about Angela Rayner is it's all over the front pages. If I just pick one up, the Daily Mail, Rayner says, I'll quit if I'm found guilty. That makes me wonder, what does she know now? that she's now saying that. And um, that loads of other papers actually this morning all saying the same uh, thing about Angela Rayner. Um, I'm just trying to find some more. Daily Express, um, oh no, that's the wrong one. Uh, but we've also got the Times and the Telegraph, Rayner on the front page of the Telegraph saying, I will quit if guilty over the house row and the Times pressure on Starmer as police look into the deputy. So I'm asking this morning, Another political stand, scandal. What does that do to your faith in politics? The number to call 0344 499 1000. You can also WhatsApp us to the same number. You can text the word talk and your message to 87222. You can X us as well uh, to at uh, Talk TV, leave a space, then hashtag Breakfast Doctors. And Dr. Rennie is all over those i am <laughs> i am right well that's good then um right let's move on shall we and talk about the economy because we got the figures i think it was yesterday actually the uk economy grew slightly in february increasing hopes it's on its way out of recession the economy grew 0.1 percent according to official figures now it was produced um, boosted by production and manufacturing in areas such as the car industry. The ONS, the Office for National Statistics, said construction was dampened by wet weather. It is an early estimate, this, but maybe it signals that we are coming out of some terrible economic fortunes. Well, joining us now is Edmund Greaves, who's editor at Mouthy Money and host of the Mouthy Money podcast. Good morning to you. Good morning, David. R really good to talk to you this morning. I mean, it's very interesting, actually. Uh, Jeremy Hunt saying, uh, we've done the hard yards, now I'll cut taxes and bet on growth. I wouldn't have said 0.1% growth is that brilliant. No, I think that's right. I'd take kind of all of this with a very heavy kind of pinch of salt. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's an absolutely minuscule increase. As you said, it's a very early estimate, so... These numbers always change, you know, with with hindsight, uh, and they're always being tweaked around. So, um, you know, it's it's good that it's not negative, you know. But we had a recession. Was it a very very shallow one? Perhaps. Uh, I think the the really uh, uh, overwhelming point here is that the the the, the economy is really sort of bimbling along at a very very uh, slow, sad. Uh, rate uh, and you know you compare us to places like the US which is kind of growing at a fair clip that, and that kind of thing and we really are you know struggling and as much as Jeremy Hunt can tell us you know oh I'm ready to cut taxes and this kind of thing now we really need some proper proper growth and productivity growth and and, and things like that and wage growth uh, to actually you know stir things up again and, and create a situation where the government can start to realistically look mm -hmm. at properly cutting taxes i mean they have done a little bit of it it's helped working people hasn't helped older people because because you know they they trimmed national insurance rather than income tax but uh for the for the government it does feel a little bit too too late for them anyway uh you know to be promising this kind of thing at this I, I quite enjoyed that word you use bimbling along and i think that's right the services sector including things like hairdressing and hospitality grew a little uh, with public transport and haulage having a, a stronger month construction though down 1.9 I thought the whole idea was we were meant to be building our way out of this. Isn't this isn't this part of the problem? It's managed decline as far as I can see. There's no great aspiration here. I don't see a great plan. I don't see how we're actually going to build a, a better Britain. Yeah, so I mean, in, in those figures from, from the, the ONS, as you mentioned, they, they did kind of caveat that we've had pretty bad weather and that does impact, you know, how easy it is to build a house when it's pouring with rain. I live down in the in the southwest and I can tell, tell you personally, it's been pre pretty wet down here. Um, the, the thing with property, the property market and, and, and building and this kind of thing is we're so constrained 
by you know development rules and this kind of thing and uh and the issues with kind of nimbyism and and, and that as a political force i think uh, is a major issue that we're not going to overcome mm. really anytime soon i don't think um there is a hint perhaps that the kind of balance of power uh in, t- in kind of political terms is is shifting from older generations towards kind of my generation, millennials, who are now make up the largest single kind of demographic. Uh, we're the ones who want houses, we want building mm-hmm. to take place. And and you're right, economic growth comes with building more, you know, and it's not just about building houses, it's about building reservoirs, building railway lines, mm-hmm. building all the things that kind of drive economic growth. And, you know, we've been a long time, you know, equivocating over things like HS2 and this kind of thing, but, but you know, even as something as big, and as I said, I live in the southwest, and we had hose pipe bans last year, and it's you know there's no new reservoirs being built. We've got lots and lots of rain, but but we keep having hints of hose pipe bans. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because we don't have enough reservoirs to hold the water for the number of people who live down here. That's a simple fact of life, and you can't grow an economy when you can't you know implement those kind of those policies that that, that help you know grow infrastructure and provide the tools for everybody else to live and get by. And it's part of the reason that actually our national debt. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? That you know we we, we are massively in debt. Yeah, I mean, we're close to kind of 100% of GDP. I, I think that will that will kind of drift down. That the long term kind of forecasting numbers from from the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, which kind of you know marks the government's homework on this stuff, uh, suggests that it, things are going to go up again before they go down. Um, there's a couple of considerations here. The first is that the inflation is going to make that debt look slightly smaller in years to come. I think inflation is probably going to run a bit hotter than we all think for some time. Uh, that's good for the government because it makes the debt look smaller. Uh, it's bad for people who hold things like bonds mm. uh, because th- those bonds be- you know, become worth less, worth less because of the inflation. Um, it will get rectified, but it's basically, yeah, rock in a hard place. Do you raise taxes? Don't really want to do that. Do you increase spending? Can't do that because of the debt. So you kind of, yeah, you're stuck in the middle. And frankly, as much as, you know, we're, we're looking for a change now, the Conservatives looking like they're coming to the end of their government, I don't really see what Labour could be doing that would be ultimately much different to what the position we're in now, tinkering at the, at the sides, waiting for that figure mm-hmm. to come down a little bit. Can, can I just ask you about that? Because, of course, inflation now at 3.4%. The front page of the FT this morning, Bernanke warns the Bank of England must change. Now, we've seen the way the MPC meets and they vote on whether interest rates should go up or go down. They're currently at 5.25%. But essentially what he says, the Bank of England's recent record of forecasting inflation and the path of interest rates is undermined by out-of-date methods and a failure to communicate clearly with the public. It's a pretty bruising assessment, this, from Ben Bernanke, who was the former US Federal Reserve boss. And he actually goes on to say, actually, the bank spent much of its time attempting to justify its poor judgment than admit failures. He's saying it's actually not fit for purpose. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the report's quite technical, so I won't go into some of the the more kind of detailed bits of it. But the long and short of it basically is that the Bank of England didn't get its forecasting right, didn't uh, respond to inflation as it's kind of soared, you know, a couple of years ago now. Uh, it didn't it didn't meet that challenge as quickly as other central banks did uh, and and basically is 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 has been resting on its laurels for for you know we had over a decade of low and relatively low inflation extremely low interest rates and it seemed to have forgotten you know how to deal with inflation mm. uh, there's some fairly fundamental questions I would suggest here um, about the role of the Bank of England uh, the governor and and the MPC uh, you know it's the first time since Tony Blair you know made made the kind of gave it its independent inflation targeting mandate that it's really had its ability to actually do its job called into question well, well quite- are there, are there I mean, it it also goes, you you will have seen this in the report, it says it uses old software to process information. And actually the Bank of England was there at the beginning and we were one of the first to raise interest rates. And I said this at the time, we were doing it in very small increments. When you look to other countries, for example, they bit the bullet, they went much higher, much faster. And it seems to me that we were just ticking up in terms of having interest rate rises 
And, and what's happened as a result is many people have been caught in a very difficult financial trap. Yeah. So the, what happened really is 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 the is the um, the monetary policy committee which sets interest rates and it it has to look at all this information. A, it was kind of getting bad data in, and you know its forecasting was 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 kind of woefully inadequate, as Ben Ben Bernanke has found. But they were kind of absolutely, as a group, terrified of causing a recession. That's why they didn't, you know, whack interest rates up straight away, uh, in order to 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 quell inflation. Now the question here is their central mandate is to control inflation so why didn't you just put it up you know significantly 100%. straight away 100%. Uh, in order to, in order to deal with it um you know yes there's a there's a danger of recession but but you know we need to get inflation is a, is a nasty nasty thing and we've all learned that in the past two years and we all see that every day now mm. um, you know it has come down to a slightly better level it's still too high um but yeah you know and, and but the, the fundamental issue with something like creating a mistake like this is it's the loss of faith in what they're doing people don't you know people look at it and think you know you guys have screwed it up you're not doing the right job and and these institutions exist to ensure that we have stability and you know uh, gentle moderate economic progress and we don't have runaway you know inflation and price rises this kind of thing but when you when you when you screw up, you create a loss of faith, and it's so you know bad because it just undermines the the institution that's supposed to be there to protect us. Can I can I just ask you about Andrew Bailey? He's refused to apologise after this review found significant shortcomings in the inflation forecast. He 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 was really bullish. He said we do not do hindsight when he was asked if he was so, sorry following the withering assessment by uh, Bernanke. In fact. I mean, the language they use, I mean, it's complete jargon. We welcome this important review and its recommendations. This is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to update our approach to forecasting and ensure it's fit for a more uncertain world. It's utter gibberish. Yeah, so the first thing I'd say here is my my hope is that they actually implement some of the report's recommendations and catch up with other central banks that, that do, you know, do a better job of this. Um, my concern is that it will get swept under the rug because we're about to have an election and this kind of thing, and it all just kind of disappear in the tumult of that. Um, I, I think I, Andrew Bailey's lack of contrition is is pretty breathtaking. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, the bank has, has has kind of presided over um, a serious uh, you know devaluation of people's livelihoods in in, in pure financial terms. Um, uh, and you know i think sometimes it's like holding your hands up and saying yep we got it wrong let's fix it let's move on mm. is just the easiest way to get past a crisis so by by coming out and saying no we're not sorry we did what we did it is what it is you kind of just again it's about it's about trust isn't it it's about faith in the institution it, it, it absolutely is can i just ask you very quickly for those people who are coming to the end of a fix, fixed rate mortgage what advice would you give them as to what they do? Do they go to a variable rate, hoping that actually interest rates will then come down, or do you fix now? So I will caveat: I'm no mortgage advisor. Sure. Um, I would I would suggest uh, speaking to a broker at least six months before your mm. your mortgage term comes up. Uh, they will give you the best options possible. Speak to your bank as well, because they will often have a deal that you can move on to without having to take a new kind of credit check and this kind of thing. If you're concerned about affordability, they will always try and help you, uh, although you may not get the best rate with them. Uh, yeah. There is always a choice, um, and I would say do not try and time rates. Do not try and time the market because you're just going to end up in a position in six months where you may not know what the situation is and it might be worse. Really good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed, Edmund. That's Edmund Greaves there, editor at Mouthy Money and host of the Mouthy Money podcast. Let me just bring you that breaking news from Sydney. Crowds have fled a Sydney shopping mall, reports of multiple stabbings and a possible shooting. It sparked a major police response. Local media reported gunshots inside the Westfield Mall at Bondi Junction. Police said a critical incident has been declared following the shooting of a male just before four o'clock local time that was seven o'clock our time uh, after reports of multiple stabbings the incident is ongoing people urge to avoid the area we'll bring you more on that as and when uh, we get it time for a break after the break we'll take your calls also uh, we will have our head to head joining us this morning jonathan liss and benedict spence this is talk tv
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen! <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist well, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was move on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast. Time 8.25 now, Saturday, April the 13th. Thank you very much indeed for all your messages. Uh, lots coming in. Um, Jeremy Hunt, he says he's done the hard work. Jeremy Hunt has not done any hard work. It's the hard-working, lowest-paid people of this country have done the hard work for him. Thank you very much uh, for that. Peter's in Suffolk, in my county, and Peter says, look, David and Rene, we have lots of housing being built in our area. I know, I can attest to that. It's everywhere. But we still only have the same amount of doctors. I think planning laws should include provisions yes. for other infrastructure. Absolutely right. 100%. Yes. This is where they always go wrong. So they build these new towns, you know, you see them popping up all the time with no infrastructure. Mm. What a beautiful morning, says Ian, made brighter by you two. It's <laughs> gloriously sunny here in Norfolk. Lucky you. Thanks, yeah, very, much. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed for letting us know that. Um, lots of other messages coming in. Also, I'm asking, uh, just in terms of this Angela Rayner story, which is over pretty much, uh, well, the majority of papers this morning, what has this done to your faith in British politics? The number 0344 499 1000. You can WhatsApp us as well, of course. Uh, you can text us. Text the word talk in your message to 8722. And Dr Rennie is all over X. Uh, you can X us at Talk TV, or you're all over X. Um, then space, then hashtag Breakfast Doctors made myself laugh. Let's take a call. Steve's in Leeds. Good morning. Good morning, Doctors. How are you? Yeah, good, good. good. Thank, Thank you. you. What, what, what's on, on your mind this morning? It was just, I've been listening to this Claire Rayner story for a few days, and I think... Angela Rayner, not Claire Rayner. I'm glad it's Claire, Claire Rayner was someone quite different. She could do with some advice from Claire Rayner, probably. <laughs> Yeah, but the the bigger issue for me, and something I've not seen people ask, ask yeah. her in Parliament is the hypocrisy of MPs that 
take advantage of something. She, she's got 48,000 out of the right to buy scheme, but now she's there saying, I'm going to cancel it if I get into power. Yeah. And it's just that constant feeling that MPs, I mean, you've got Sir Keir Starmer went to grammar school. I wonder if his parents would have been able to afford to send him if they'd have been charged VAT on the fees. But now they're in power. It's like, well, it's OK, I gain the benefit, but you lot, you peasants, you can't have that. And it's just, it just, it makes you feel like they're so out of touch. It's this constant, it's OK for us to have parties during COVID, but not for you. Mm. It's OK to us to have a pizza. And I think when I talk to friends, we just feel that all politicians are the same. It's all about what's in it for me. And it's all right, I'm all right, Jack. And you lot have to suffer because you're not as important as I am. And, and the Claire, Ray, the Angela Rayner thing, I just wish somebody would say to her on camera, how do you feel it's right that you've gained 48 grand out of a Margaret Thatcher policy, but nobody else is going to be able to take advantage of that <coughs> moving forward? And, and yeah. as I say, I, I think it's an incredibly strong point. I'm going to put it to my panellists, actually, in, in just a minute. Thank you so much for your call. Thank you. Uh, Steve, and that's a lovely segue, actually, into this morning's head-to-head. Uh, -head. Head to head. Well, joining us this morning, Jonathan List, political commentator, and Benedict Spence, political commentator. Good morning to the two of you. Good morning. Salam Very welcome. lovely to see you. Let's start, shall we, with Angela Rayner. It is all over the papers this morning. Labour's uh, deputy leader, Angela Rayner, says, uh, and this 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 happened last night, actually. Oh, it happened this morning, I think. When I went to bed last night, it wasn't quite at this position. She now says she will step down if she's found to have broken the law. Uh, she says she is completely confident I followed all the rules at all times. Now, she's been accused of giving false information about her Main residence in a row about who lived in her former council house. The reason this has moved on is the police now say they are investigating. And this comes on the back of the Conservative Deputy Chairman J uh, James Daly, who uh, made police aware that actually the neighbours are contradicting her statement that she gave. Benedict, you, uh, we, I think we spoke about this um, during mm. the week as well, and I said this story isn't going away anytime soon. It's not, although having said that she'll step aside if convicted, uh, she can sleep safe in the knowledge that thanks to the cuts to the criminal justice system under the Tories, that won't take it for another three or four years at least, so she's got plenty of time. Um, I think it's one of those where if she's actually sort of come out and said definitively, I will resign if I'm convicted, I suspect that she's probably had quite good legal advice. She would have sat down with somebody, gone through the entire situation and they've gone look maybe you've been a bit silly but you're probably safe in that even if you have maybe broken the law or broken some rules it might not be in the interest of the crown prosecution service to pursue a prosecution so you're right it's one of those things that's rumbling on and on and on it might not necessarily lead to her resignation i suspect it probably won't but what i think it's a sign of more generally is a lack of preparedness perhaps for the labor party this is effectively a nothing story that if she has done nothing wrong could have been nipped in the bud very quickly yeah, and gone away but it's been allowed to roll you know like a giant snow ball down the hill it's turned into something when it didn't need to be they're not even in government yet and already the attacks are happening what's going to happen when you've got 300 odd MPs many of whom have got no experience of being in, in politics at all and people are raking through their personal activities you know that this has got to be a wake-up call for for Labour they need to sort of get their discipline in order. get a uh, Facebook well, yeah. well, well I was saying Jonathan actually are we starting to see some very nasty dirty tricks being played um, as we approach the general election is this a storm in a teacup I mean I had um, uh, someone on yesterday Today on the breakfast show saying oh it's only about a matter of 1,300 pounds my point was it's not about the amount it's about the principle did you break the law well obviously you know in there are minor there are minor sort of breaches of the law that take place every single day I mean should someone should someone sort of, uh, lose their lose their career for uh, a traffic offence for example but you could be going no, no no but I'm just saying there are all kinds of we, we, we take it we take a kind of a nuanced approach to the law every single day and we kind of think what is uh, a, the kind of offence that should end someone's career and what's the kind of offence as Richard Sunak you know Rich, no one called for Richard Sunak's resignation when he was um, caught without a seatbelt for example I'm not saying it's not important but I don't actually agree with what was what Benedict just said about the Labour Party allowing this to snowball because the Labour Party did try and nip this in the bud 
they said over and over again this is a, this is a nothing story and the Tories basically bullied I don't the police think saying chased by Dan Hodges at the Daily Mail into into pursuing this story I don't think saying it's a nothing story is nipping it in the bud I think I actually agree. laying out the paperwork so, and saying look this is where the misunderstanding and, occurs is nipping it and, in the bud. and this is the point isn't it that actually she could and we spoke about this earlier she could have nipped this in the bud because and, and we were just talking to that caller about the fact is she bought this house the optics are awful whichever way you look at this she bought it under the right to buy a scheme which I know she has absolutely her, her rights to do that yes yeah. that is right <coughs> when she bought it for 79,000 she sold it for 127,500 making a tidy profit of 48,500 but the point is which was her primary residence because if it wasn't if if her primary residence which actually it appears it may have been in Vicarage Road. There's a lot round this, isn't there? Why were the children registered at that other address, for example? So it's not actually about the fiscal amount. It's actually, did she do this deliberately to avoid capital gains? OK, tax? so there are, I think there are two separate issues. And obviously, you know, none of us here is a tax expert or a lawyer. And so I have been sort of just consulting people on Twitter who are, I suppose. And what you find, you know, from experts who, who are talking about this is on the capital gains tax, it's not a criminal issue. Uh, evading tax is criminal, but in the same way that Nadim Zahawi, there was yeah. no question of him being prosecuted. We know that he didn't pay the right amount of tax, and then he did pay it, but that is not a crime. That, so that's not what the police but, are investigating. But what about this so the, breach the, of the, electoral, the electoral yeah. thing? Yes. Now, when you talk to lawyers, they say that actually, if the police were going to prosecute that, it would have to be done within a year right. of, the, of the events actually being taken place. So the Financial Times was talking about this yesterday. They'd asked um, Greater Manchester Police for a comment as to what could could be the maximum uh, sort of act that they could take, or the worst, the most severe act they could take, if the law states you can only launch prosecution within a year. So as far as as far as we're concerned, this is a complete nonsense. Okay. All of it, it's just for show. Sure, but taking it back to what Benedict said, that I don't think saying "look, I didn't do anything wrong" is enough. I agree, and I think what she should have done at that point, if, as you say, even if these aren't criminal acts, if she did make 1,500 extra pounds because she wasn't actually living there. She should have come out ahead of it and said, you know what, I've made a mistake. I was living with my husband and children. I'm sorry, and here's the money. I mean, Renee, look, I have no idea what Andrew Rayner's living circumstances were, and obviously neither neither do you. And so if she has provided... I mean, it's provided... quite interesting. You saw all the soft <coughs> furnishings which were in that primary yeah. residence, which were in the secondary residence. David, we know... Come on, we know that people have complicated lives when you have two houses. Or two sets of soft furnishings. Well, I mean, if you're I'm having to, if you have two properties, actually. you are in fact allowed to have furniture the in one same, of them. They're exactly the I, same. I, this I, was I, the I Daily Mail. I, mail do, this is, this I is do agree silly. with this, this silly silly though, problem. actually, is that lots of families do have very complicated living situations. They go through a divorce, they have children, you know, they have she just multiple. got married. It's, well, I think that did she, hadn't she yeah. also recently got divorced and she has since got divorced from this person? People don't have easy, straightforward lives. No. And also, I'm not going to deny, I have no problem with people trying to pay as little time as they can. I happen to think the capital gains tax in this country is uh, e e excruciating and I think it's also bad optics given that Rachel Reeves has very recently announced that the Labour Party is going to invest over half a billion beefing up HMRC to go after people. Obviously the implication of that is it's going to be the super rich but it's never the super rich that, that, that they go after it's people at the optics. bottom. Yes, so it's very bad timing. As I say, I don't, but this is the thing actually, I mean this is why I suspect nothing will come of this. Andrew Rayner would not be foolish enough to go out and say I'll resign if I've done anything wrong knowing that oh there's so, a chance so you think that she, she but has I some think pretty that. strong, strong oh, I'm uh, so, I'm so, and, and, and even if she has, I suspect the CPS would say this isn't in the public interest to pursue the electoral mm. thing for ver for various different reasons. It's but it does, as you say, it goes back to optics. They're not even in government yet. And the response was not so much to say, look, here's full transparency. We're against sleaze. We're against all of this. We're not like the Tories. We're not like Nadim Zahari um, or whoever. Yeah. The, the response was, go, it's a nothing story. I Don't actually, talk about it. Right. Does our caller, however, does he have a really I didn't, interesting... I, we, we didn't hear okay. what he said. So what he said is it's not just hypocrisy over Angela Rayner. For example, there are plenty of Labour politicians, I think, Chakrabarti is one of them who sends her children to private schools but doesn't agree with private schools. You know, and they Keir want Starmer, to wallop on VAT on went private to a schools. grammar school. He might not be able to do that now if there was VAT on it. At, Diane Abbott sent her children. Yeah, to but Starmer doesn't schools. send his children to grammar school. It's not Starmer's fault they went to school. No, no, but, but where Ren is going is sent her children to private school, but she says that they're absolutely horrific. Why? I mean, why Abbott. Yeah, Abbott. Sorry. Why are these Labour politicians allowed to criticise all the things that people like to scrimp and save for and give their children the best start in life? Do it themselves, but come out in public saying it's wrong, it's elitist. Well, Diane Abbott, you know, that was many, many years ago, and she actually, I think, she apologised 
apologised for it you know, subsequently and she said that she wouldn't do it now. But Diane Abbott's also but, not, but in, not in the Shadow Cabinet. that question, though. For but example, obviously... right to buy, also VAT on, on private schools as well. David. Why, why can Labour politicians enjoy those those uh, those things that, as Rennie says, you scrimp and save for, but they don't want anyone else to have them? I think, that's, I think that is a kind of a disingenuous argument about the whole right to buy thing. If you clearly, in the same well, way... She wants to get rid of like, it. In the same way that if you believe that taxes should be high for everybody, uh, but you are asked to pay a certain rate of tax, you're, no one's going to expect you to sort of pay a, an additional bit. But if you had the moral high ground, surely you wouldn't have used the right to buy if you believe that it's actually I fundamentally don't... unfair. Well, I think that if you look, if you are being offered things, uh, and, you know, again, I'm not Angela Rayner's spokesperson, I'm not her sort of moral judge, but I think that it's, it's legitimate uh, to say that you are part of a society and that you have the same rights and obligations as anyone else in that society. If you were in charge of that society, you would do things differently. Differently. She's not, you know, she would argue um, that she's not trying to make life harder for people to own a property. She would go about it in a different way and they want to build more houses. Uh, you know, and I don't think that, you know, there's the, the, the right to buy is just going to, it's not going to be scrapped altogether. Um, how how by big a, a problem government. is this for Labour, do you think? And no, no problem at all. Honestly, the fact that the, the fact I, I really don't think that I obviously I can be proved wrong, but the same way that no one now, uh, at least I haven't had anyone talk about the whole curry incident in the last two years. No one talks about it now. It never comes up when people talk about. But Starmer. of course, now is a slightly different time, isn't it? We're coming up to a. Look, I think the people can see what this is, David. They can see it's a smear campaign. They can see it's a target. See, a, that's it's not a campaign what, of But harassment. that's not what people are saying. And I'll, I'll come to Benedict. Um, Angela Rayner. This is Susie. She should show us the paperwork about the sale of the house and resign if guilty stop going on about her working class background well she said that she resigned she's guilty she yeah. she did but she she is refusing and also this goes back to the fact is in hartlepool by-election she criticized the the tory candidate also a mark in commentary good morning to you mark says the thing that annoys me over rainer is she was the sheer hypocrisy of the whole thing she bought the house under maggie's right to buy a scheme a scheme she is opposed to and then sells it for a profit so so actually people are cross very i think, be, I think people are cross i don't think that they sort of think that it's just a witch hunt but i don't think that this is a big enough story for them to think oh do you know what i'm going to vote tory i think that they look at yeah. you know this story and juxtapose it with everything that's gone on in the last 14 years and they go I can probably live with this frankly you know given the state of things that Labour are going to be inheriting oh, the <laughs> Tories are not exactly free of sleaves well, well, are they no, well, no. they what happens in the Conservative Party in the last few years but so, so, I, just want to bring, I, I just want to ask you also Graham Stewart's quit as energy uh, minister and I just wonder what your thoughts are on that is that down to just a personal issue and also there's a lot of rumblings going on about what will happen and when this general election will be I think we spoke about this in, yeah. in the week any thoughts on Graham Stewart I think I think he is an MP whose seat was a uh, seat was formerly a safe seat and is no longer a safe seat. And so I think, think he, he wants to spend more time with his constituents. So he wants to work. The yes, seat. I think that he would like to remain an MP. Is what right. I think, and this is a sensible <laughs> right. uh, career. Decision. There are no safe Tory seats these days, David, as you know. I, I do indeed. I know very well. And then, uh, then it begs the question: If you were Rishi Sunak, when would you call the election? Would you hang on till the very last minute? We were talking about this. The, the, all the political commentators, like Ryan Sabi, for example, are saying it's October. I just wonder, do they do they go early, which I think would be disastrous, or do you go late? Well, if you well if you're him, and you know, again, I have no interest in in going inside his mind because I'm not sure I'd find anything there. But if uh, if Ooh. I were him, um, <laughs> you'd have to think: Do I want to be prime minister for as long as I possibly can be? In which case, you know, go in, in December and be mm. sort of you know, or, 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 or better, go in January. Let's have a Christmas election. Let's just like be canvassing over Christmas. That will really that will really please the uh, the local um, campaigners. Or do you think? I want to avoid um, uh, the, the greatest route in history, so I'll go early to try uh, and sort of stave that off because it's only going to get worse from here. So mm. let me take that comment to you. Mm. Will he lead the Tories into the next election? I suspect he probably will. I don't think that's the smartest decision, but I think that they don't have the courage, actually, to risk it. I also don't think that there's the calibre of MP prepared to put their head above the parapet and say, I'll take that risk. I think that there are several who are lining up for after the election mm. to say, I'll take, I'll take over afterwards when it's slightly easier to pick up the slack. Um, but I think that this is that's a general reflection on the state of the party itself. There is nobody who thinks, I actually think that I'm good enough. Lots of them want to be prime minister or leader, but none of them actually is convinced that they're good enough to pull that off. And then we go, do we get into a kind of an interesting constitutional question as well? Because if, for example, the Tories did um, have a vote of no confidence in him, 
he could he be within his rights to the immediately court. go to yeah. the he would happen yeah. then Which he's going he's do. going to be so, the he's so, going to be the, the, the leader of the conservative party in that election and, and i will go to a break but what i've heard is that after the uh, the may elections on may the 3rd he will then go to uh, ask for permission for an election because it could be the point that he realizes they've done so badly that actually he does do that thing where he pulls the rug from everyone's face that's why face. he's very foolish not to go at the same time as the locals actually Mm -hmm. I think he should have done that because, because yeah, I, I said we, we said all along that's going to be such a, a catastrophe for the Conservatives. That is going to be the narrative that follows the Conservatives into the summer. Yeah. If they'd had it at the same time, at least they could have died with dignity. <laughs> <laughs> Send them to dignitas the whole lot of them, honestly. Right, and on that note, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan Benedict uh, and Jonathan. There, let's go to a break. We'll continue with our head to head after this break. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to, it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast. I, I just want to update you on what's going on in Sydney. Several people are now feared dead in the shopping centre stabbing. Several people have been stabbed. A man has been shot at a shopping centre near Australia's Bondi Beach. Australian media said four people have died. More been injured by a man stabbing people at the Westfield Bondi Junction Centre. In Sydney, New South Wales police said in a statement a critical incident has commenced following the shooting of a male at Bondi Junction. Just before 4pm, emergency services were called to Westfield Bondi Junction following reports of multiple people stabbed. Uh, and we'll bring you more on that. The Australian website has now reported a nine-month-old baby was amongst those uh, stabbed. Um, other websites are reporting witnesses are claiming a man was stabbing shoppers at random uh, before being shot 
by police. We'll bring you more on that as we get it. Uh, we're in the middle of our head-to-head -head at the moment with Jonathan Lewis and Benedict uh, Spence. David, about this whole reign of things, says Pete in Boston. I have two thoughts on this. Firstly, another MP up to skullduggery. What a surprise. Secondly, Reina has been like a rabid piranha fish going after the Tories and anyone else for that matter, should she smell blood in the water. So live by the sword, die by the sword. It would be really nice now if Parliament realised that we, the electorate, are sick and tired with the greedy, childish actions. Two-party politics is killing voter engagement in this country. One more, uh, Dean in Cannock says, isn't it typical Jonathan List defending Angela Rayner and tries to make out this is a non-story? I'm pretty sure he'd have a different view if it was a Tory politician. I'm not going to let you answer that. <laughs> and I think it's important to say that John <laughs> Jonathan made a comment about dignitas at the end of the last section, which some people have taken offence to. I'm sorry, I, 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 I apologise. What I meant is Presumably that the Conservative... dignitas the con customers. The Conservative Party... See, I'm going no, to, see, I'm go I'm going to join in. I'm in solidarity. Let's not make it I'm worse. Going, what I'm people have to. said is that there are people going relatives yeah. Going to dignitas, it's not something to joke about. So I just wanted uh, to balance the I, I, I apologise if anyone was offended by that. Yeah. I was obviously making a light hearted joke about the Conservative Party being put out of its misery and by consequence ours as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's move on. And shall we talk about Gibraltar? Because I think this is a really interesting mm. story. Conservative MPs fear the government has made concessions in trade talks on Gibraltar in order to appease Spain. It's been very quiet, actually, what's going on here. Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, was in Brussels on Friday for talks with his counterparts from Spain and the EU, as well as Fabian Picardo, who is Gibraltar's chief minister. This is about the border. They believe a political agreement has been secured. This has been dragging on for, what, 18 rounds of talks now. Now. And there are lots of questions over sovereignty of Gibraltar. Well, of course, it is with British territory. Where do you stand on this? Because my, my worry is that they are going to allow things like Spanish boots on the ground in Gibraltar. Mm. Obviously, there is a border issue, uh, and many people cross the border every single day to go to work, for example. Yeah, I, I don't see why the British government would give any kind of concessions, any kind of you know, administrative concessions over any British overseas territory. We don't need to. You know, Presumably, a trade agreement with anybody is a sort of a cooperative thing that works for both people and if one side is prepared to say no to it on the basis that it wants to claim on your territory you tell them where to go we wouldn't do this with Argentina over the Falkland Islands we wouldn't do this with any but well actually no that's not true I think we would increasingly island. clearly we would do this with a lot of our, our overseas yeah, we stuck a border in the it, sh it shows that we are pushovers it shows that we're not serious and actually if the people of Gibraltar don't want it what business is the British government doing? You know, th this is one of the great sort of irritants that I have is that you know the British, British government talks up about you know uh, sovereignty of Parliament, uh, mm -hmm. our great system, our great democracy. It is happy to sell British citizens and uh, mem uh, people in British overseas territories down the river uh, to make its life in the short term a little bit easier. And that is, I think, the attitude of this government and various iterations of this government ever since David Cameron became Prime Minister. Anything to make your life just a little bit easier in the short term and to hell with the long-term consequences. Mm. Where do you stand on this? Bill Cash has said um, he, he needs assurances the UK military operations in Gibraltar haven't been compromised. We have an RAF base in Gibraltar as well. The people, the Gibral Gibraltarians, believe passionately they are British. They voted to be British. Do you think that's true, that actually politicians are about to sell it down the swanee because they want short-term gain? Well, I think we should be very clear that Gibraltarians voted sort of ninety nine percent to be British, and they also voted, I think, ninety six percent to stay in the EU. So uh, let's not get too where are um, you going with haughty. that? Because, David, the reason that we're having this debate, the reason we're having these negotiations mm. is because Gibraltar was, as Benedict points out, sold down the river because their lives were actually pretty good. They had the perfect balance um, being... So what do you want being, to do with them? ...being in this position where they were dependent on the EU but also outside the EU and also very much a part of the UK family while not being in the UK. Brexit obviously completely exploded that equilibrium and it, because there are so few people there, it was never a major issue, but it gave the Spanish a key bit of leverage that they've been seeking for decades. And obviously, um, now they have it, and now they're now they're trying to use it. And actually, I think we should be very grateful that they haven't um, gone further, because they could have they could have closed the border as the border was closed until I think 1985. And um, they haven't done that. Obviously, there are a lot of Spanish people who depend on mm. Gibraltar as well, who go mm. through the border, and and so obviously that wouldn't be in the Spanish in the in the Spanish government's interest. But I think that we have to acknowledge that it's only uh, because of the grace uh, of the Spanish government that things have not been made a lot. <laughs> 
worse but, but for Gibraltar. Gibraltar since is Brexit. a strategic um, part of the UK. It's, a it's not part the of the UK. Strait. It's not part of the UK. It's, 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 it's an overseas territory. territory. Overseas territory. But it's a, it's a strategic part of the world. The Gibraltar Strait is a very, very important part of landmass. I think what worries me more about this story is that everything's being done again behind closed doors and we don't know I anything totally that's going agree. on. That is what concerns me. It's like the World Health Organization so, negotiations. We know nothing. So, so we need to know. I just want to throw into this. It, the Gibraltar Air Show on the 28th of September was due to t uh, take place. The Spanish then said if there was a display by the RAF, it would seek to prevent it from happening. Uh, and in fact, they scrapped the Red Arrow's, uh, Arrow's appearance. And they said they, they did that because they were worried about the Gibraltar's post-Brexit border arrangements, which you bring up. Also, apparently, HMS Queen Elizabeth, uh, the largest vessel ever constructed for the Royal Navy, didn't actually sail to Gibraltar because of what's going on. But we are where we are. My worry is we're going to cede sovereignty because the Spanish, as you rightly say, has a foothold in uh, David, I, I, no, what I don't think is that we're going to cede sovereignty and the Spanish know we're not going to do that. Um, clearly, um, the British government has a long-standing convention that, um, that there is self-determination in overseas territories in the same way there is in the Falklands. And I think that's, a, that's not a left or right issue. And that Gibraltar is clearly, they want to be British despite everything. And so <laughs> they should be allowed to, to do that. And look, so what, what the, 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 the substance of the deal is, obviously, I I don't know but what I can tell you is whatever happens is going to be a lot more difficult than it needed to be and a lot more difficult than it was before this disaster. Is that what I told you so? I mean, yes, it is. I, and I wrote a report about this actually in 2016 I mean, about how difficult it was going to be. Malta wanted to remain part of the UK. The people of Malta voted actually. In 1955. To remain. It doesn't, doesn't matter. They were told under no, under, under no uncertain terms that they weren't going to be allowed to. So actually, I simply don't trust the British government. You know, mm. If we were serious about this, I think we, we would do a lot more in terms of pressing the claims that Spain has in its enclaves in northern Morocco, Melilla and Quetta, and we'd be saying, well, OK, if you want to sort of cede some sort of sovereignty there or you want sort of a different arrangement there, maybe we can have some sort of access to this little, you know, access to North Africa there. There mm. needs to be some sort of quid pro quo, because I suspect actually the Spanish government doesn't really want that issue to be raised, given that the Moroccan government is obviously very unhappy about that. Maybe there's a pressure point there that can be applied. Uh, you know, it's but obviously it, it these things seem, are very... doesn't it, that our politicians are absolutely useless negotiators? It's so I come to the point that they can't all be just naturally useless negotiators. So surely it's because they're interested more in their careers and the global club than they are in little individual... Fundamentally, they don't really care too much yeah. about British people who are not their actual Indeed. constituents. I mean, you can see that in how Northern Ireland has actually been treated. And the fact of the matter is that the average British MP, English MP rather, yeah. doesn't know anything about Northern Ireland exactly. and doesn't want to know anything yeah. about Northern Ireland. So that imagine that how they feel about Gibraltar. The, yeah. the first two years of the Brexit debate that, you know, people... Oh, like, my organisation... Yeah. My organization published a report about Northern Ireland and Brexit, just as we did about Gibraltar and Brexit in 2016, and the government denied there were any problems with either of those, but particularly Northern Ireland for two years. Indeed, as you know, I campaigned and we said we would leave as one United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Of course, we got sold away. We talked about the 80 seat majority. They could have actually ensured that didn't happen, but it did happen. And I agree with you. I don't trust the British government either. No, I don't. And again, it, it, not to sort of go back, I am very concerned over the future of the Falkland Islands as well, because actually I do think that that quite question will come up again in our lifetime. It is not simply a question for Argentina. Who is, you know, who are the two biggest countries backing Argentina competing for that mm. space? It's China and the United States. And the big fear is that the amount of money that China is pouring into Argentina and to, into its military, that the United States will actually lean on Britain to give more territorial sovereignty to Argentina in order to offset that. Why is that important? Actually, because there is an awful lot of mineral wealth in Antarctica. Mm. That is the access point to Antarctica. That is the only reason China is taking an interest. And I in sailed past it. Uh, yeah. Only the other week. Is this Rishi Sunak's moment? Maybe, maybe this is how he wins. Does he actually say, "I'm going to stand up for British overseas"? Stand up for the foreclosed. Exactly. Rejoice, <laughs> rejoice at that news. Uh, yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe that's the idea. Gibraltar is a start. It's, it's a little small. I could just see, I could just see him in his sort of in his wig outside Downing Street. So just, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think. That, I think you need more I sleep. Think, I think that Sunak is whatever, whatever you say about him. I don't think he's going to launch some kind of defensive no. war. No. I don't think against, that, uh, the against army Spain really for gonna. Gibraltar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, proportionately, Gibraltar yeah. fits in better than the yeah, I was going to say, pick your battles, pick yeah. your battles. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Very good to see you. Benedict Spence, thank Jonathan you. Liz, thank you very much. That was today's Head to Head. Head to Head. Right, let's take a call. Gary is in St Helens in Lancashire. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. morning. What's on your mind this morning? Right, I just want to try and clear something up about uh, doctor's availability. Right. 
Right. Uh, what I did, I'm, I'm 83 now. Uh, no, no particular problems. I just rang up to see if I could speak to a doctor. <laughs> uh, well, you've got to. Well, you got fire to. away. Yeah. Yep. Right, two op- I've got two options. Right, the first option was for a smear test, right? So I'm, I'm not a lady, so I didn't want that one. The second option was pick a day you want to see your doctor. So I got the... Uh, it, it said, like, you know, you, you got one day, two days, yeah. three, four days. Two months. So, so, so essentially, you, you can't see a doctor when you need to see a doctor is the basic... Well, I mean, two months, I mean... Uh, oh, it's appalling. OK, you know, so... You could, you could start and finish a war in two months. Yeah, so let me say this. Um, I've been very critical of GPs along the way, and especially during COVID when they closed their doors. There has been guidance to say that GPs should see a patient within three weeks for a re- routine appointment and on the same day if they have an emergency. I don't understand why GP practices are giving you an appointment in two months' time. In my practice, there are always same-day appointments for emergencies mm. and you can get a routine appointment with me within two weeks if, you don't, if it's something you don't need to be seen urgently. So I think you're right. Two months is absolutely disgusting and shouldn't be happening. Maybe it's just unique to your area, I don't know. GPs, to defend them, are seeing about 40 million more patients, and I say seeing, I mean having contact with, be that by phone or seeing, than they were pre-pandemic. There are fewer GPs than Mm. there were pre-pandemic. The government were going to deliver an extra 5,000 GPs in that time. I think we're losing another 8,800. We're actually losing. I have have um, uh, an opinion. Uh, Well, I just want to throw it in and see Mm. what what, what it sounds like to you. Uh, Right, Booper... Right. Mm. Yes. You know what Booper is. Yes, yes. You? Sorry, time is very tight. So, uh, yep. Right. So, Booper, I could, I could ask to see a doc. Say, say the doctor's name is Mr. Simpson. Yep. I right. I want to see Mr. Simpson. Okay. Uh, uh, how many days do you want? Uh, da, 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 da. Right. You've got two months before you can speak to you on the phone, not speak to you by person to person on the telephone. Right. You know. Okay. Right. Time is short. So I, I really only have a minute. It was in Booper, I could say, I want to see Mr. Simpson. OK, because he gets paid for it. It's the same Mr. Simpson. Who gets- it, it is, but just to yeah. counter that, because yeah. the way clinicians work is they are contracted to a certain number of hours for the NHS, and what they do in their free time is up, to, up them. to them. And, and so that, that is, unfortunately, the system we're in. Gary, I'm so sorry I have to uh, end the call there. As I said, time is very tight indeed. Uh, thank you for your company so far. After the break, we're going to be popping over to the United States. Caroline Faraday will be joining us. We're going to be talking about a number of stories taking place over there. We're also, uh, later on this morning, I have Steve Denya joining us for Denya's Delights, a big favourite of ours, I think, when Mr <laughs> yes. Denya uh, pop, pops in. Uh, that uh, will take place at about 9.20 this morning. Also, we take more of your calls, your thoughts and your opinions. Don't go anywhere. This is Talk TV. We're broadcasting live from London. This is Talk TV. Never mind the ballot. A brand new look at all things politics from The Sun with me, Harry Cole. Watch my big end of the week with no stone unturned. Every Thursday evening, exclusively with The Sun. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, uh, missing. <laughs> there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we was supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hello, very good morning to you. It's just after nine o'clock now on Saturday, April the 13th. I'm David Bull. This is Weekend Breakfast. Thank you very much indeed for your company. Now, if you have just joined us, I have great news for you this morning. It is International Plant Appreciation Day today. Yes, it's a day dedicated to recognising plants' incredible diversity, beauty and importance. Uh? It's also International Scrabble Day today, a day when we celebrate the popular board game. Now, it falls on April the 13th to mark the birthday of its creator, Alfred Mosher Butts. Yay! And uh, good news for Rene, uh, the Take That Tour 2024 <laughs> begins today in Sheffield. The question is, could it be magic? And I think it probably could be, yes. Wow! Wow! Yeah, wow. Right, let's uh, go to today's fascinating fact, shall we? Today's fascinating facts. Dr. Rene, Dr. Rene, what were they? 1570. Yeah, it's very good. Guy yes. Fawkes was born. Yes. Where was he born? Uh, York. Yes. And no, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. No. And he went on to carry out the gunpowder plot yes. in 1605. Very good. A very impressive indeed. Next one. Okay. Um, 1742. Yeah. Handel's Messiah yes. was played for the first time in Dublin. I'm really confused by that. Why would it be in Handel's Messiah in Dublin? But anyway, OK. Yes, very good. 1935. Yeah. Imperial Airways. Yes. Launched... Oh, with Qatar Airways. No, with Qantas. Qantas. Not Qatar. <laughs> Ran the first ever London to Sydney yeah. flight. I mean, that's interesting, because I then thought Imperial Airways, if you remember then, became BOAC, British Overseas Airway uh, Company. I don't remember. Which is the... Well, I wasn't around. But um, <laughs> it's the precursor of British Airways. But I think that they... British Airways also... Anyway, they, they merged, and that's how it all came about. Anyway, you did very well. Thank very you well. very much. And you had some others as well that I really can't remember. <laughs> we'll leave it there. <laughs> shall we? Uh, those are today's fascinating facts. <laughs> now, I just want to bring you uh, the news uh, that's coming in from Sydney. Uh, several people have been stabbed. A man has been shot at a shopping centre near Australia's Bondi Beach. Australian media said four people have died. More have been injured by a man stabbing people at the Westfield Bondi Junction Centre 
In Sydney, New South Wales police said a critical incident has commenced following the shooting of a male at Bondi Junction. Just before 4pm, emergency services were called to Westfield Bondi Junction following reports of multiple people being stabbed. News website news.com.au reports witnesses claiming a man began stabbing shoppers at random before being shot by police. It's also reported by an Australian website uh, that a nine-month-old baby was amongst those who were stabbed. We believe the baby is now in hospital. That's the latest uh, coming out of uh, Sydney. We'll bring you more on that as and when we get it. Lots of messages uh, coming in uh, as well. Uh, thank you for all of those. Alison says, good morning, David and panel. Great debate. Thank you. Although I'm sick and tired of all this gotcha politics and media coverage on all sides and with most high prof profile people. Um, regarding Angela Rayner, a fish rots from the head. The behaviour of those wanting to lead should be beyond reproach. Um, I can't read some of these because we're in Perda at the moment because we have the local elections coming up. Uh, but let's just say uh, many of you feeling very passionately about certain parties. Uh, this is quite interesting. Ivan says the May local election results will be so disastrous that Sunak will be forced to resign. So the election in January. Now, there's a differing opinions on this because Sunak could, sure, they could lean on him, but he could then go to the country. He could, and if I were him, that's what I would do. Well, take now. everyone down with you. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, and that's yeah. the threat that they're probably living with, isn't it? Mm. Look, if we do this, this is what he's going to do. It's a game of poker. Politics is always a game of poker. But real people are caught in the middle of it. Yes, because but they're not listening to us, David. When did they last listen no, to no. the people? Um, interesting. Mick, one of our regulars, says, uh, Good morning. Standards in politics and the public sector have rapidly declined due to second best being the norm and the lack of self-discipline. Let me give you some examples. The police, the civil service. I think he's onto something there. I think he is, but I think it's also a combination of the fact that any time a politician now tries to stand up and do something bold, there will always, without shadow, be somebody who says, that's not fair. Mm. Be that welfare, be that sick notes, be that schools and education, be it trans stuff, whatever it is, mm. there's always a, a minority group who will stand up, they'll get the front pages to say, this is going to disadvantage me massively. We've moved to this minority mm. group rule now, where as soon as somebody shouts, that's it, it doesn't happen. We need to go back to the majority. We need to make rules and laws for the majority. Where did that go wrong? I was just I was just sort of ruminating in my own head. You know, when and we've talked about the, the military threat that we face, when when the country if the country does become under enormous threat, do we then pull together? Is that what it takes? I'm not sure, actually. I'm not sure there's enough base cohesion for that to actually happen. Because, again, the minority who don't agree with whatever the war is, who mm. don't agree that we should have, you know, soldiers fighting, will be the loudest. So it's all me, me, me. It is all me, me. It's an entitled society. Mm. And we're not thinking of the greater good of people. How do we change it? Well, we would need somebody very bold, much bolder than any of the politicians that exist to this day, who would be prepared to stand mm. up like Maloney did, but then to follow through, because she's not even following no. through, because now she's under pressure. Mm. God, it's fascinating. We should talk about that another time, actually. Uh, right, let's pop over uh, to the United States. It's time for Transatlantic Talk. Transatlantic Talk with Caroline Faraday. Yeah, Caroline Faraday. <laughs> <laughs> Morning. Well, it's nice to have the yeehaw. Well, I forgot it? it. I think I forgot it last week, didn't I? I know. It's had two weeks of Christo and he didn't do it. Oh, he didn't do it? Oh, well, yeah, that was ages sad. ago. I mean, yeah. I've been back for a month. It feels like about three years. Uh, how are you? I am so well. How are you? Good. I'm probably not as well as you, Good. given that you're so well. Um, lots going on in the States, though. It is never a quiet week here, is it? We're <laughs> no. going to have a really busy week starting next week. Monday, oh my goodness, this is an historic day really, but not for all, not for any good reasons. Um, it is the first uh, time that a former president has been on a criminal trial and that will start on Monday, Donald Trump's criminal trial in the hush money. Pa I know there's so many that mm. you're going to have to tick it off your <laughs> list of things that Donald Trump is in, in trouble for. But uh, this one is the hush money payments to the adult movie star Stormy Daniels. Yes. 
Carry on. I'm transfixed. I will. So, in case you were following this, <laughs> here's what happened. <laughs> Basically, uh, in the 2016 election, um, he apparently had a, let's call it a liaison, mm. with uh, Stormy Daniels in 2006 ish. And um, in 2016, he didn't want that information apparently coming out in the public eye because he was running for president of the United States. And he paid her, allegedly, $130,000. Now, this all came to light through his former fixer, Michael Cohen. What's wrong with that, you say? So what if he paid her $130,000? Well, this has got to the level of being like a felony because he then falsified, it is alleged, mm. his business stop his business accounts his his business records um to cover up that payment and it is also alleged that that that, that payment was done deliberately in order to to cover up uh, a, a criminal a piece of criminality so it to get it to the point of a felony charge he has to have done more than just paid hush money if that makes mm, sense mm. it has to be deliberate and it has to be you know, for certain reasons. So, so this trial starts. Uh, it's not Monday tomorrow. So it starts on Monday. Now, what does yeah. this do? What does this do to his chances? Because we've talked about this before, where Trump turns everything to his own advantage. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is the thing, isn't it? If if it was televised, I would say it would absolutely escalate them. But every time that he is involved in any anything like this, any sort of legal action, it is a moment where he uses it to campaign. However, it will take him off the campaign circuit. That trial could last six weeks. Wow. Each count, and there are 34 felony counts, carries up to four years in jail. Now, even if he's found guilty, I think there is the, the likelihood that they're going to say, OK, you're off to jail for 136 mm. years, I think is, is pretty slim. Uh, <laughs> it's there, so. but I think that that's pretty slim. I think it's more likely that he would he would find himself with a sentence that is something like a suspended sentence, something that's a non-custodial sentence, if it ends up in a, in a guilty verdict. But there's sort of everything to play for. But what happens is, is it raises his profile yes again and it also enables him it's so extraordinary if you were talking about a politician in the uk campaigning mm -hmm. <laughs> and being able to campaign and fundraise <laughs> off the back of being on criminal charges it would blow your mind but he is mm. this total exception to all the rules he really, he really is. Should we talk quickly, if we can, about O.J. Simpson? Uh, we did quite a lot on this on the show yesterday. I, I wonder what your response is. Uh, obviously, uh, this is O.J. Simpson, the former American football star turned actor. Uh, he died uh, at the age of 76. What, I mean, obviously it's an incredibly complicated story. It gripped the nation and that particular trial, as you remember, was really the advent of 24-hour news and that slow yeah. car chase. I remember where I was in 1994 when that took place. And, and I think everyone was watching that. What's been the response in the States? Well, that's it, is that moment, particularly the car chase, there isn't anyone who uh, watched that and there were 90 million people who watched that who can't tell you where they were where, during the, the police chase where he was hunted down. If we were having a conversation in 1994, pre... Uh, pre that police chase about O.J. Simpson, we would be reflecting on the life of somebody who was an exceptionally successful football star who crossed over from being a sports star to being a movie star. Mm. But all of that was eclipsed by his criminal activities. That was They were eclipsed by the murders of her, his his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and her friend, Rob Goldman. And I think for their families, the, the death of O.J. Simpson is a moment where they've really realised that they will never get any yeah. accountability, mm -hmm. get any justice, that that will never come about. So I think that's really the reflection. He is just a figure... Again, we've been talking about people you sort of 
love to hate. He was a figure of fascination. Mm. Um, and this and this incredible moment, it, like I said, 90 million watched that chase that you're watching. Over 100 million watched the, the verdict where he was found not guilty, very sensationally, of those murders. Um, and it was really the advent that that was of, of not only 24 hour news, but reality television. Yes, and, and the timeline is really complicated. So in 95, he was acquitted. There was then a civil case in 97 uh, where the payment was $33 million. And then just to cap it all, in 2008, he was convicted for 33 years of armed robbery. I mean, you're right. I mean, again, we were saying yesterday, does this become the thing of movies? If I submitted this as a movie script, people would say that is ridiculous yeah. you've gone too far what a ridiculous script you cannot possibly have this as somebody's life story i mean it is so out there that reality way overshadows anything anyone could come up with in their imaginations that would be believable really that the 33 million in in damages by the way in the civil suit yes they got some acknowledgement not no jail time no no criminality mm -hmm. They've never seen a whisper of that 33 million. That has escalated now. It's about 100 million, I think, that's outstanding. And I doubt they'll ever see hide or hair of it. No, I'm sure um, that's right. So, you know, it, it's 33 million in, in name alone, really. And yeah, then, then he was involved in an armed robbery in Las Vegas. Um, he was sentenced to jail. He came out, he, he, was, he got quite a long sentence, like you say, but actually came out quite soon ish on parole. So, yeah, it, it, very intre it was very much, as they say in sport, a game of two halves. It very, it, well, it very much was. Well, it was three halves because he had, had this film career and I'd forgotten completely that he was in the movie Towering Inferno. Yeah, well, the thing about O.J. Simpson, if you, if you go back to that sort of point in time, he was this good-looking football star who crossed over mm. and kind of was cross-racially um, uh, popular, you know, he was very mainstream. He, he was in commercials and then had this film crew. He was in, na he was in the... Um, he was in Naked, Naked Gun. Gun movie, yeah, you know? Naked Gun was brilliant. He was almost a... He was a comedy star before he was you know, uh, uh, you know, he wasn't so much a serious actor, but he was in a lot of comedy movies. I mean, it's extraordinary. As you say, uh, you know, uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Now, we'll move on to uh, Disney. Rene loves a bit of Disney. I do. Yeah, well, I, I know. Like I put this the old in there, stuff. especially. The old stuff, oh, not, I, not I, the new woke stuff. Oh, I haven't seen any new works. Well, I haven't had time, but I like the theme parks, I have to say. And actually, yes. a picture popped up of me with uh, one of my nieces, actually, at Disney uh, a few, quite love, many, many years ago. The theme parks. In the Magic Kingdom. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, what's the news on Disney? Listen, when you went to Disney, what was the thing that none of you liked? The queues. Yes. That is the first question when anyone says, We're going to Disney. Oh, what about the queues? Okay. So, for people who don't like queues, not don't like queuing, I'm going to rephrase that. For people who uh, don't get on with queuing, who perhaps have challenges queuing or their children have challenges queuing, there is a program that Disney run that's very valid. Um, but that program, the number of users has tripled. So is it, this is like fast, queue, pass. fast pass, that's genie. what it It's oh. the genie, isn't it? It's the genie. Well, this is a, a free, it's a kind of free oh. because this is for people with disabilities right. where they can't stand in line. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, what they've said is, well, you know, we're not going to let people use that. So basically kind of like crack down on it. And anyone who misuses it because it has uh, got mm. so popular is going to get a ban for life. Whoa. If you lie about your disabilities, Disney getting hardcore. <laughs> Disney getting on well and rightly so actually because uh, uh, that that kind of behaviour isn't isn't acceptable. I noticed there that you have become very American. You said get in line. We call it queuing here. Oh, queuing! I know. Have you tried saying that? I say all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> now I have to ask people whether they're in line if I'm seeing they're there and say various other things. I, I told you that when I lived there, I uh, I couldn't understand what cilantro was, and I kept going around yeah. thinking, oh, is this this new herb? herb because they say herb oh um, you said herb with no eight yeah i know so that's what you lot say and then so it turns out cilantro isn't a new herb it's coriander it's coriander mm. yeah right there with your basil and your oregano <laughs> 
Yeah, and your eggplants. And your eggplant, which is aubergine. <laughs> yeah, I love an eggplant. Stop it with your eggplant. Yeah. I know you. Um, so. Caroline, always a great pleasure to talk to you there. Caroline Faraday over well. <laughs> in the United States with her eggplant. That is today's Transatlantic Talk. Transatlantic Talk with Caroline Faraday. <laughs> Your, what did you say? Oregano? Yeah. Yeah, not or oregano. It, and aluminum. Aluminum, yes. Well, they can't spell either, can they? Although they're, they're very literal in their language. So, you know, we say, we say pavement, they say sidewalk, because it is where you walk at the side of the road. You know, they say yeah. trash can, we say dustbin. You know, they're, they're quite literal. I like some of their language. Do you? You yes. can live there. <laughs> Goodbye. We'll pay for a ticket. Uh, no, I'm being rude. Um, Rene, thank you very much indeed uh, for the moment. Uh, keep all of your calls um, coming in, please. Your messages coming in. We'll go through some of those. After the break, uh, Mr Steve Denyer joins us with Denyer's Delights. Don't go anywhere. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist well, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast. I just want to update you on what's going on in Australia. Reports suggest five people are now believed to be dead as a result of a major incident at Bondi Junction, Westfield, which is a six-level shopping centre in Sydney's east. Multiple stabbings have been reported. Ambulances responding to reports of a male running around Westfield with a knife. As we were hearing earlier, a mother and her baby have been reported as being amongst those being treated for stab wounds. Police now say a male was shot dead at the scene of the attack. It's not known if the death toll of uh, the five, oh, it is now known, actually, it does include um, the attacker that is being updated as 
we speak. We'll bring you more on that as and when uh, we get it. Um, just on a lighter note, many of you uh, to, uh, sort of muscling in on the Grand National, of course. Uh, we were talking about it's the Grand National. Some good runners and riders. I'm going for Mr Incredible at 12 to 1. Rene, you were going for whom? I'm going for Cocoa Beach. Oh, Cocoa Beach, because it's mm -hmm. cocktail, yes. Um, I just got one here. Here's a tip for you for the National, says Leighton. Creosote. It's great over fences. <laughs> I thought that was very good. I thought that was extremely good, actually. Thank you very much. Keep all of those uh, coming in. Also, uh, some of you are very naughty indeed. Uh, Graham says, when you say you love an eggplant, do you mean the vegetable or the emoji? I think we'll move on from that. Thank you very much indeed. Lots more uh, coming in as well, uh, talking about the Australia attacks as well. Uh, keep all of those coming in, please. But now, the highlight of the week, of course, <laughs> it's time for Daniel's Delights. Genius Delights. Hello. You're so kind to me, uh, and it's always a thrill to join you. Happy Saturday. Yes, yes. Happy, Saturday. happy Saturday. Lovely you guys to see doing? you. You're Lovely looking well. You. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, all good. Fighting fit. Beautiful weekend. Weather's going to be good. Is it? I can't see because they've shut the blinds. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like, you know, I think summer's on its way. Yeah, thankfully. I Most mean, of us gonna... are going to be... Go on. No, no, I was going to say, I drove home, actually, a couple of days on Wednesday, and there's all the blossoms come out on the trees, and I thought, thank goodness we're through the most terrible part. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think we can't come soon enough. I was in a pub last night. There's no surprise, surprise there, surprise. Really. And all the blossom was flying everywhere. It was just beautiful. I just pub? thought It's called the Horseshoe, which oh, is in the, the shadows of the Shard. Quite near here, actually. <laughs> Staggering distance. We, we, went, uh, we, had, we decided to do all of Chris Evans's team. So come on, let's meet in the afternoon. I was still there at 7 o'clock. Hang night. on a minute. We went but there the other day, the horseshoe. Yes, we have been there, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, no, so we also had a do the other day there. That's oh, hidden. Okay. It's hidden down the back, of, yeah. isn't it? Well, the horseshoe is the Street. part that Mike Graham broadcasts from when, do you remember after lockdown and they opened pubs up again? Yes. Mike did the show from, I, uh, from the horseshoe. I believe the horseshoe was the pub where I was invited to discuss joining you at weekends. Was it? <laughs> yes. With me? <laughs> For lunch, no, not with you. Oh, not with me. Well, I, if <laughs> I had a say it with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who was it with? Right, so we, should we talk about um, Gordon Ramsay? Because I'm, yes. I, I mentioned this earlier on. Tell us about the squatters that have uh, attacked Can one of you his just pubs? imagine Gordon Ramsay's language with all this going on? So he owns this really this £13 million kind of pub where he's sorting out the lease at the moment. It's right near <laughs> Regent's Park. It's called the York and Albany. So it's closed at the moment because they were negotiating a new lease. However, these professional, highly professional squatters, about six or seven, have moved in. They're using his kitchen to make meals. Uh, you can see it on the front page of The Sun today. Um, and he can't get them out. And apparently it's a nightmare. They've, had, they've completely wrecked the inside of the pub. And it, it's kind of a legal loophole as to whether they can get them out or not. And you'll see pictures, I think it's page five today, yeah. in The Sun. Oh, um, my goodness. Predicting some of the language. Uh, this place has kind of been... They've a... barricaded the doors, yeah. glued the lock shut, yeah. they've crashed on the leather sofas, turned the bar into a tip. Now they say it's their home and they've put up a legal warning. Yes, yeah, yeah. and I'm not quite so, sure how. I mean, do you know more? I, so what I'm going to say about this is, you know, people are asking to strengthen squatters' rights and tenants' rights and yeah. Labour are saying they're going to do that. That would be fine if the courts were working. The courts are not working. Mm. So the problem that Gordon Ramsby is going to have, that he won't get any special treatment, he'll rumble through the courts, and I know, because I have had this over the last year and a half, that every time you make the right form and put it into court, you are three months before you even get a reply. Mm. So it is taking a landlord 18 months to legally evict a tenant, whether they're damaging the place, wrecking the place. Even if you have a tenancy agreement. Yep, yeah. not wow. plain rent. So it's taken me 18 months to get to a bailiff order. My tenant hasn't paid rent, he's smashed up the bathroom, you know, and meanwhile I have to pay the mortgage and sit uh, here and just watch so, that so, so, uh, Sorry, I don't want to pry, yeah. but did you have an intermediary, an agent involved in all I this? didn't, that was a mistake, yeah. but I had, it was a friend, but I had a tenancy agreement and I did it at half the market value. Don't rate. rent to friends. And do it cheap. Is the person yeah, still a friend? <laughs> what do you think? Um, <laughs> But the point is, it would be fine yeah. if the courts worked. And this is the problem that Gordon Ramsay's having. He's well, he's got powerless. six of them, apparently, so, yeah. Six professional squatters. They used his own kitchen appliances to barricade themselves in, glued the shut 
the locks. So what's he? What? So so this is the York and Albany pub. Yeah. I mean, it's near Regent's Park in Central It's very Lowry. exclusive. Yeah. Really is quite chic. Um, he's had problems with this before. There was legal wranglers, I think, in 2015. If you read the article, um, so he, he shut it. They were trying to negotiate a new lease. Mm -hmm. Obviously, squatters know they know the deal, don't they? So they've come in when the building is you know empty and shut and broken in. And you'll see some of the pictures today. They've kind of wrecked the place. I mean, look at that sofa mm. uh, inside. So I don't know how they, this is going I mean, these squatters are um, scrolling on smartphones. Um, they've obviously been shopping. They've got Sainsbury's bag for life, tobacco plugs, empty water bottles, wine. All, it, all, all done. So basically it comes back to the me, me, me society. Does, so they it? feel that because other people have done well and have actually bought things that, that they are have valuable, a right to... that they have the right mm. to do this. So, so what's he going to do? We don't know. Apparently it's a, it's a proper nightmare. I think what he should do is maybe go in there and use the guys and do some kind of reality, I'm, see how good uh, cooks I'm they are. I'm staggered. So they've stuck this note on the front saying, um, here is a legal warning that we occupy the property at all times, there is at least one person in occupation, that any entry or attempt to enter these premises without our permission is a criminal offence. <laughs> and anyone who's uh, any one of us who's in physical possession is opposed to such entry without our permission. If you attempt to enter by violence or threatening violence, we will prosecute you. Yeah. What? Oh, the irony. <laughs> exactly. You may receive a sentence of up to six months imprisonment and a fine of up to £5,000. It's I don't, ridiculous. I don't think they read that. I think they just kind of went, went straight in and made themselves at home. But yes, yeah, it is ridiculous. I mean, honestly. Honestly. I, I actually feel sorry for him. That of is, course. It's really not It's, really it's bad. not really, really bad situation. Um, Harry Styles has done well. Yeah, Harry Styles has done very well. Uh, Step forward, our highest earning singer. Do you want to know how much he earned last year? He earned £2 million every week last year. Now, I've wow. worked this out on my app. It's £290,000 a day. you think he'd buy better clothes, wouldn't you? They are <laughs> dreadful, aren't they? I mean, I know I sound Oh, old, but, but he looks good in any... He could wear anything. No, he, he could doesn't. go on stage in a he bin really liner. He really doesn't. Look at, what, look at that. Really doesn't. That is a mess, a shambolic mess. Well, I wouldn't wear it, but, you know... I, mean, <laughs> I don't know, you'd look I'd good. I'd give it a go. <laughs> yeah. He looks like that comedian entertainer guy, um, the short one, who used to wear the cap as well that matched those. What he oh, called it? No, 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 no. Kids, kids one. It'll come to me in a minute. OK. I, so... No? Just An old one or a new one? Timmy Mallet. Yes. Timmy oh, good, Mallet. I got that. Oh, yeah, I know Timmy Mallet. Well, by Mallet. the way, Timmy Mallet is on Virgin Radio 80s Plus this morning at 10 o'clock. What, oh, what a great segue. What a segue. This is why I'm paid... The big bucks. ...what I'm paid. Uh, <laughs> Harry Styles said £71 million pounds on concert tickets. So if you're good a star, it's really interesting. If you are a star, this is what Taylor Swift is proving, you have to go out there. You have to perform. The money is now... It's not in the kind of streaming. No. Uh, the money is in the performance. So, like, £30 million pounds just on the merchandise dice from so sort of like the t-shirts and you know the harry styles so, bags so what, what is it about harry styles that sets him apart how has he become this great sort of icon what is it in your your, your in your view i think he's a terrific performer i think especially for people in this country we, we feel like we've grown with him from his days you know on on tv on the x factor with one direction what have you um, and it's really the music the last album is incredible I love Harry's house. I love every single track on there, and they're all different, and they're all kind of forward-facing tracks. He's got brilliant producers. Some people say in years to come, he he will be the Mick Jagger of the current generation. You know, he he will grow and grow and grow. Interesting. Yeah. Now uh, <laughs> we spoke about Back to Black. I think the pre did it start yesterday? Premiere. It did. Yesterday, yeah. yesterday was the first now, day. Now you, because uh, you've got lots of friends, um, you went on your own to oh, see. <laughs> you went on your own to have a look at it. So, well, so, so, all, so there were a lot of reviews on this yes. about whether the, the lead character can actually sing. Yeah. I saw the trailer and I wasn't overly impressed by the trailer. Well, can I just pause you there? Can yes. we have a quick look oh, at the trailer just to give people an idea? Let's hope we've got the trailer. I don't think I was put on this earth just to sing. Me. I want to be a wife. I want to be a mum. In my head. Probably run off with someone famous anyway. You're my heartbeat, you're my soul. I love you. In my tears dry. I don't bang out tenets by lunch. I need to live my songs. So that's what I'm going to go and do. So, I yes. saw that and I was like, mm, mm, not really. 
I don't know. Okay. I, oh, I you don't like quite that? like the look of that. So, it, so made me, it made me feel that she was a human being. She wanted to be a mum. I, I don't know, it made me go cold. I can't okay. remember the last time a movie has had so many different reviews. Mm. So Chris Evans saw it this week and he says, Steve, it's, an, it's a nine out of ten. It's, but he was really raving about it. Right. The male gave it a one-star review yes, and it's really yes. interesting and my friend david went to see it last night and he said it's dreadful he said <laughs> if you want to watch anything about amy you should watch the documentary amy which came out a few years ago and my argument is we know that we've seen that we we know how desperately sad and how shocking some of the moments were in the end of her life this is a movie that looks at her family, her performances. Mm. I mean, Marissa, who plays Amy Winehouse, is incredible. Bear in mind, you're hearing her singing the Amy but, but Winehouse songs. But I had all songs. these reviews saying that she can't sing and she didn't sound like her. Well, I, th I have to disagree. I think the Grammys uh, re the recreation of what happened was incredible. The highlight for me, they recreated her 2008 Glastonbury performance and it really is you really feel like you're there when her life's kind of spiraling out of control what i would say is i think this movie is meant for an american audience we know too much we remember the headlines day after day we remember waking up in the sun and watching her life unravel i think you know an american audience will just about remember her remember that night she won the five grammys remember the performance mm. her camden town is burning down all that kind of stuff my one problem with the movie is blake Mm. Um, I think they've been too kind with him. He also looks like Dermot O'Leary, <laughs> stroke James Dean. You wrote he that never on looked, Facebook. He last never time. looked like that. I no. mean, he's very like glossy, kind of like Hollywood. Uh, but it makes London look amazing. Does it? It makes. Oh, I'm all in favour. It's kind of a love affair of Camden and the pub she went to, <laughs> and Ronnie Scott's and performing there. There's there's um, scenes in Soho late at night. Really does look very special. So, so I, I've read a lot of reviews also saying exactly what you said. It, it's been tailored for an American audience, yeah. a global audience, mm -hmm. and so therefore, you, yet where you and I might be more critical of, say, the accent, for example, yes. the global audience might not know. Do you remember walking past that crematorium when you had to march to my house and said it was a million? Miles. It was a million miles. That's oh, the crematorium. Do you know, I've never been so hot. I got off the tube and I walked to her house. I had to stop. I had to stop halfway. It was absolutely miles. She said it was only five minutes. I think she? this is the barbecue that I wasn't invited that's to. That's right. That's the one. Yes, yeah, that's the, the one. Day. She's that having day. another one that you're not invited yeah, to. Yeah, OK. Right? But, well, I'm busy. Uh, but, <laughs> but honestly, go and see it. You haven't asked yes. my review, uh, my, my number out of ten. I would say eight and a half out of ten. OK, um, I really did enjoy it. It's, it's very much like Bohemian Rhapsody and the treatment that they gave Queen. You know, it's very kind of glossy. Uh, there's, 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 there's good moments, there's bad moments. It doesn't shy away from the drug taking and the desperately sad mm. moments where you see her in a bad way, but go and see it, have an opinion. I might drag him indoors along tomorrow. Oh, hmm. does he have a say in this? No. no. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Are you seriously having another barbecue? <laughs> Sorry, that's bothered me. I'm now bothered. Uh, no, no, exactly. Uh, let's move on, shall we, to television for people who are staying in. What, what, what have you got for us? So this week was the 30th anniversary of Kurt Cobain uh, passing away. Obviously, it was a suicide. It shocked the nation. Tonight on BBC Two, they're looking at um, Nirvana. Uh, there's a great documentary, which I've got a little bit of. It's called When Nirvana Came to Britain. And look at the, look at the hairstyles. Look at the clothing in this early nineties. What were we thinking? Having sold over a million records in six weeks, they're straight in at number nine. Here's Nirvana with "Smells Like Teen Spirit." It was time for the music industry rock. This little band from Seattle having the audacity to like break onto TV and be so subversive. Much more before America. You guys were the first with everything. Nirvana brought to Britain the most. They left an incredible legacy to. I've never seen Look at those t shirts. Again, like, everyone looks like they smell really badly. They probably, they they uh, probably do. <laughs> why, why were you turning your nose out watching that? Well, they just look grimy. They do look grimy. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. So, so, so the fascinating thing is, obviously, they've gone down in this, like, legendary status, the whole band and Kurt. When they came over to the UK in 1989, no-one knew who they were. They had to basically play in pubs 
shops in the north of England. There are people, uh, there are landlords who say, when well, Nirvana played in our pub to desperately try and get some kind of success, mm-hmm. they slept on couches. Um, it they really was. They, shower. they They needed showers. <laughs> you can tell. Uh, they played the, the, mm-hmm. the performance they did on The Word, which has now gone down as a legendary performance because of some of the language used at the beginning of the performance. It's a real snapshot of where the UK was mm. in the late part of the 80s when Margaret Thatcher was in power, we had the poll tax riots, oh there was Section 28 going on, and it just shows you what we were what we were thinking and how we were looking <laughs> and the mistakes we made. Yeah, so it's right, tonight, they've got loads of... They've got this documentary about uh, moments that shot shook music and then there's this documentary about when they but came to Britain. But there were real segments of music then weren't there because I was not in that segment at that time No you time see I was about to say exactly yeah. that it passed me by completely. <laughs> me yeah. But then were we too old? No I know exactly where I was at that particular time with the poll tax rights I was into UB40 and Scar and all of that kind of music oh. Lovers Rock. Yeah. Mm. So that completely was off my radar. You had the rave scene you had Mad Chester with the Happy Mondays and stuff and yeah. they brought the next thing the, yeah. grun- the grunge thing that kind of kicked in so remember when Kurt Cobain passed away, the band were really big, really, really big. Mm. They were, you know, the peak of their success. And they kind of spearheaded that whole grunge thing. So uh, mm. it's amazing. Really okay. great documentary. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pause, actually, if okay. I may, because I know you've got more to tell us. Uh, let's go for a break. This is Talk TV. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t- when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Uh, welcome back to Weekend Breakfast. There's lots of you getting in touch. Uh, this is Roy in Devon. Harry Styles has no style. His music makes me run a mile. I agree. Um, I know you won't agree with that, <laughs> that Mr. Right. Daniel. Uh, it did. That was the whole point. Uh, we were talking about Gibraltar earlier we as were. well, weren't we? Yeah. Uh, good morning, doctors. This is Simon in Hull. <coughs> good morning to you. Good morning, doctors. Cracking show. Let's give Gibraltar back to the Spanish and then we get Benidorm in return. Let's face it, it's practically British already. I would, I would concur with that. It is practically British already. <laughs> Already. I have one from Mike who mm. says, Renee, you're right. A teacup rattled and the government stopped drilling for shale gas, which would have helped save the country's economy. Yeah. A few kids glue themselves to the road and we send billions to China to make wind turbines. Minority rules now. Yeah, I agree totally. Steve Daniel is still with us for Daniel's Delight. Hello, hello. Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, no, no, that was something completely different. <laughs> now, theatre. Theatre. I've heard a lot about this show. Yeah, this this show, I should be so lucky, Stock Aiken and, Mus uh, Stock Aiken and Water from the Musical, has it's been going around the country and it's one of these things it's a joy to see it's getting better and better and better and better how many reviews. times have you seen it i've seen it once oh, right. i saw it i saw it here in london about two months ago um they, what they've done is they've shoe shoehorned so many songs in there's like a kylie medley with all the kylie songs in mm. but it's not cheesy well it kind of is but it works right you're not like oh god this is dreadful. and so is it in london now or is it um, so control? tonight is at the bristol hippodrome right and there are tickets going it's spending the the next week it's kind of going around the country week by week by week it was in Hull the other week I saw it in Richmond in London so so and the idea of this is this because they're essentially working out whether they can have a sustained West End run is that is that the concept yeah I think so it's it's really weird because it started off in Manchester mm. and it got very shaky reviews and they 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 must have kind of just Changed worked it. on it and mm. stuff um it's 40 years since the first Stock Aiken Waterman song was released. What was the first one? The first one was, and it wasn't a big song. The very first one. It was. It was released. It was kind of under the radar. They hadn't even got the PWL thing going yet. Right. The first one that label. most of us remember is Princess. Say I'm your number Say one. Say I'm your number one. It's yeah. a brilliant song, and that got right. them into the top ten. And then, of course, there was which know, is actually a very unusual because that's not really their normal sound. No, it's a bit dancier, isn't it? Mm. And also, remember when Stock Aiken and Walton produced their own song, Roadblock? Years was ahead, that theirs? That was theirs, and they used sampling and stuff. And people are like, oh gosh, this is a really interesting well, sound, and, and and really like quite cool club DJs started playing it, and then found out it was, it was all Stock over Aiken the clubs. It was yeah. all over the clubs, Roadblock. Renee, you're looking very no, blank. but I didn't really do clubs. No. But then you had, like, Banana Rama, who changed their style yeah. and released yeah. Venus, and you had Which Sinisa, was brilliant. and you had Mel and Kim. See, I think then, Kylie when I think yes. Stock Aiken. Yeah, and then but the Jason next... Donovan, then you've got yeah. to think about Banana Rama, and, and then, you've got to think, what was the other one you just said? Um, you know, there was Sonia as well yes. in the late Sonia, 90s. There was, there was big fun. They worked big with Donna fun. Summer. Donna Summer's career had ended, really, after the disco. Oh. Lots of controversy there. She came over and she said, guys, can you make me sound relevant again? And they worked on This Time I Know It's For Real, I must that brilliant see album. <laughs> Yeah. Honestly, yeah. you'll love it. People are up no, dancing I, I by really the end. Want to go and see dance it. routines. Yeah, fantastic. Right. So is it coming back good. to London? Well, I, hope I don't so. get out much. At the moment, it's been... I'm, I'm looking. There, there are no firm dates. Is it but... going to Ipswich? <laughs> I'm not in Ipswich, but I, I could be. It's close. It won't, it won't go Honestly, there. I is it actually lucky. going to it? .com. See? Google it. Go through it, because otherwise <laughs> right, I'll, I'll be have here a look. for Right, fine. And ages. then, and then, then also, should we talk about what else is going on tonight? We've got some gigs tonight. Uh, big gigs. James Blunt. He's very funny. So if you see James Blunt, he's at the Utilita Arena tonight in Cardiff. You, you and he, went to this the other night. Yeah, you? I have seen him. Yeah. yeah, he was at Manchester last night. Oh no, it was James Max went the other night. He said he was at. Yeah, he I was think at it was the Royal Albert Hall, Hall, wasn't yeah. he? There was. Um, you know, apparently the same jokes every night. I've got a friend who's been to see this gig three times. It's oh, like, it's the same him. joke. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's tried and tested. Yeah. Uh, but he's great. He does this little thing where he gets everyone to do a Mexican wave during one of the songs, and it's quite funny. Um, and he's released so many good songs that you might not remember, and you go along to the gig and you think, oh, I remember this. Yeah, yeah. The other big one is Ollie Murs. James Mers. Blunt. What? You're can, Beautiful. Can I, you're Beautiful. Yeah, that's, that's all I can think of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Also, 1973, Wise Man High. No. No, no. okay. You all know these songs. See, I'm kind of with songs. you on this. Goodbye, my lover. Mm. Uh, well, I used to work at another radio anyway, station. Uh, well, Max said, Max said to me the other day it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a showman. He's mm. such a great showman. He knows how to... You know, he's, he's got the audience in the palms of his hands. It's something quite special and to watch. And then Ollie Murs? Ollie Murs, we'd take that. It's a mutual billing. So I Oliver said that Take That, that starts today. That mm. was in the Fascinating Facts. There's that's all great in news, Sheffield. Um, yeah. And, you know, Take That are incredible. It's a bit weird now there's only three. Yeah. Because you kind of go, 
you know, mm. Robbie. I mean, the Robbie Williams thing, it would just be incredible to see him on stage with them again. Mm. I think it will happen again one day. I think probably <laughs> during Walking the anniversary, <laughs> maybe in the next couple of years, the anniversary of them splitting up in 2026, <laughs> maybe Robbie can make. But I saw him as a hologram and it was rubbish. Oh, uh, really? So there's the three of them. Uh, Gary Barlow, obviously, he's the master of Take That, and all the hits are played. I mean, Ollie Murs so is talented. such a great back catalogue yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So. I think Ollie great. Murs is so talented. So I think do I. Yeah. It's really good. Mm. And that will be one big party tonight. One big party. It'll be great. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Lovely, Lovely to, to see, you, see you. Can't wait for the barbecue. <laughs> OK. OK. <laughs> I'll, I'll I've just ordered me out. When is the barbecue? I haven't decided. Oh, we'll okay. see. OK. Uh, we'll, we'll be issuing tickets to Renault's <laughs> bar barbecue as well. And we'll be getting a car to pick David up from the train station. Yeah, because it's miles. It's us. Miles. Uh, Steve, thank you very thank much you. indeed. That was today's Denya's Delights. Denya's Delights. Uh, right, let's take some calls. Uh, Chris is in Surrey. Good morning to you, Chris. Morning, lovely doctors. Morning. Oh, that's very kind of you. What's on your mind this morning? Well, there's a few things I want to say. First is, I want a ticket to the barbecue as well. Yeah, well, honestly, Damn. it was a great barbecue. <laughs> You're welcome to come along. Uh, we'll put the tickets online. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, uh... Ref, oh, I, I must just thank you both as well. Unlike other presenters on Talk TV, when I text in, when I'm having a little rant, you actually read them and like the ones that you like, which makes a difference. It makes it makes me feel inclusive in the show. Oh, oh well, thank we you very try. much. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you for the effort. Um, right, Rainer, there's something that people are missing here. And it's not that it, it, David, you're absolutely right. It doesn't matter if it's fifteen hundred quid mm. or fifteen million quid. Uh, the offence is the offence is the offence. Yeah. But the the thing that's missing is that she purchased under the right to buy. Correct. Uh, which which people and it, this is a fact. People that own their own properties tend to vote conservative, mm -hmm. uh, which is why the right to buy was brought in in the first place. Uh, and why she wants to close it down, but only after she's gained from it. And that hypocrisy reminds me of the earlier front bench Labour, Michael Meacher, Gosh, who, yes. stood up in, who stood up in uh, the House of Parliament and gave a roaring speech about second homes and it, was, it should be criminal and the homes should be homes and nobody should be renting them making a living. A year later, he was found out to own seven and was renting six of them out. Um, it, it is sheer hypocrisy. I am absolutely fed up with both sides yeah. of the same, co same coin. David, I want you and Tice um, and, and possibly Farage, um, if you ever settle somewhere, I want you to come up with a manifesto. There are people out here that will vote for reform. Look at, look at what you talk about every time you're on. Trump and how, how he's seen through everything, all right? And everybody ignored the, the norm. That could happen here. If you had a manifesto that was constantly being read out to people so they could understand that you're not star right, you're not some uh, half-wit right, right-wing gang, but you actually, you have the country at heart and you have some fresh ideas and move away from the two stalwarts that have ruined this country over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, um, Chris, Chris, I have to be very careful what I say because we're in Perdra at the moment because we're in local elections. So I'm going to let... I, I, I will thank you for your comments. Yeah. Renan can answer that. So I think you hit on a really interesting point here and I think Trump is the example of it. And I don't think it's because Trump is so super special. I think we have here what they have in America, which is the masses don't feel that anybody speaks to them or listens to them in the first place. Trump is doing that. Now, whether he goes ahead and implements those policies is a different thing, but he's listening and he's echoing those thoughts. And you're right. We need someone from any party who will actually do that. And at the moment, we don't have that. Um, and it's worth, and I, I think I can say this, it's worth just looking online for policies from all parties. Um, I think that's OK. Thank you so much Thank for your you, call, Chris. though, Chris. Really good to talk to you. Lenny is in Ashford. Good morning to you. Good morning, David. Hello, morning. Lenny. Morning. Yeah, of course I remember you. How are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm tickety boo. Thank Good. you, mate. Good. Yeah, well, what it was, when it come to Liz Truss, on the Friday night that she uh, announced her budget, I phoned a radio station and predicted her fate. Did you? Yes, I did. 
mm-hmm. and uh, and and I did the same on Saturday and on the Sunday on a different radio station. And what it was, it it was very very simple. A policy did not make sense, and it was her ego that was driving her, and not her brain. And the Queen could see that. Well, well no. so that's... The, I'm, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, I do like that comment from... And Liz Truss will tell you this. Uh, from the Queen, which was, take it easy. And, mm. and, and and the Queen, I think, gave some very salutary advice. I actually think Liz Truss was right in many things. I think she went too far too fast. I, th- I don't... Yeah, I don't agree with you, Lenny. I think her policies were actually very good. And when I heard that budget live, I, th- I was absolutely excited by it that for the first time ever we were making a change. What she didn't do, however, was take the markets or the banks with her. She or didn't stand them. up or brief them. She didn't stand up. She did an absolutely rubbish... PR job and went too fast. Well, my argument to, to which I would, if I was, to, if we had time to debate it properly, was Liz Truss. It all did, it was all down on trickle down. It was to make the rich richer uh, and let the money trickle down to the poor. That's what we have well, now. That's a country, but that is the country well, we are living in. Well, and well, it's well not she, she she actually wanted to cut tax, didn't she? She wanted to actually grow what we talked about earlier on this morning, actually, which which is growing our way out of this mess. I mean, we have the highest tax burden in seventy years in this country. We were talking about uh, how much debt we're in, in in percentage terms, in terms of our GDP, and ninety nine percent of our GDP. It's a total mess. Yes, but it was the rich that was going to gain the most rather than the people that need it. Well, it wasn't because there were tax cuts across the board. You can't just keep taxing the people at the top and just keep giving it to the people at the bottom. You've got to encourage people to go out to work. You've got to encourage people to build houses, build infrastructure. It's the only way. And, and, and I think, I, I think I, you know, it's a really important point that about actually making sure we put infrastructure in so that we build houses, that there is aspiration, that people want to go out to work. You know, it goes back to what we talked about with the fit notes, for example. Yeah. And we need to get uh, the country back on, on its feet. Thank you so much, uh, Lenny. Let's take one quick one, if we can. Ian in London, good morning. Hi, Ian. Good morning to you. Morning. Uh, the Angela, the Angela Raynor, Rain, Ranger... Kerfuffle. Although yeah. I agree with the criticism completely, the Tory minister's son, who's responsible for selling off council houses, owns 40 of them. And the same excuse, ha, ha, he's done ha, nothing ha. wrong. He hasn't broken the law, but it's ethically and morally reprehensible. So, so I, I'm, I'm a bit confused yeah, in not... that. Anyway, Ian, thank you very much uh, for your point. Unfortunately, I don't have time to delve into that because uh, Peter Cardwell has uh, danced into the studio. Uh, I'll tell you this. Good morning, Peter. Good morning. Hello. Um, so we've got a lovely, a lovely message here. I look forward to your weekend shows, but I especially look forward to seeing David's face when Peter Cardwell tries to creep into the studio without being seen. It's hilarious. <laughs> and yes. you did it again this morning. Good morning. Did, did, I, did I manage straight to not be Renee. seen? Yeah. Did I, <laughs> straight over me. Straight over Renee. Well, that's the main thing. Did busy, <laughs> busy show? Um, yes, very busy show. We're going live to Sydney, of course, with yeah. what the horrendous events that are unfolding there. Hopefully, now it's over. They say the threat has been neutralised, the attacker has been shot and killed. But I've been talking to people for the last couple of hours in Sydney, messaging friends and relatives and so on. Obviously, there's a huge expat community out there, Irish and British people as well. So I have some relatives there, so I've been checking their OK and so on. We're going to get the absolute latest from one of the top reporters in Sydney there. We're also going to talk about this Angela Rayner Roy over her council house. Of course, we're talking to uh, Dan Hodges from the Mail on Sunday, the paper that's been at the uh, forefront of that. And I mentioned the soft furnishings in two different houses, exactly the same soft furnishings that came up in the Daily Mail report. Trust you to notice that. Uh, we're also talking about rents rising, about voter ID and whether it's a good idea. This is the first set of elections where they're idea. absolutely mandatory. And also, I don't really get why we need Trident. I just think if we're going to be obliterated in a nuclear attack, it's probably going to be swift. It's a deterrent. So, is it though? Yes. Is it really? Yes. Yeah. So I'm we'll going to talk to phone in. Defa- yeah, phone <laughs> in. Uh, we'll we'll see if we can if we can make time for you. I'm not sure we can. Oh, right. um, but uh, I'm going to talk to.